The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Translated by William Hobson. Author's Preface. In which it is proved that, notwithstanding their names ending in O.S. and I.S., the heroes of the story which we are about to have the honour to relate to our readers have nothing mythological about them. A short time ago, while making researches in the Royal Library for my history of Louis the Fourteenth, I stumbled by chance upon the memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan, printed, as were most of the works of that period, in which authors could not tell the truth without the risk of a residence, more or less long, in the Bastille, at Amsterdam, by Pierre Rouge. The title attracted me. I took them home with me, with the permission of the guardian, and devoured them. It is not my intention here to enter into an analysis of this curious work, and I shall satisfy myself with referring such of my readers as appreciate the pictures of the period to its pages. They will therein find portraits penciled by the hand of a master, and although these squibs may be, for the most part, traced upon the doors of barracks and the walls of cabarets, they will not find the likenesses of Louis the Thirteenth, Anne of Austria, Richelieu, Mazarin, and the courtiers of the period less faithful than in the history of Monsieur Anquety. But, it is well known, what strikes the capricious mind of the poet is not always what affects the mass of readers. Now, while admiring, as others doubtless will admire, the details we have to relate, our main preoccupation concerned a matter to which no one before ourselves had given a thought. D'Artagnan relates that on his first visit to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the king's musketeers, he met in the antechamber three young men, serving in the illustrious corps into which he was soliciting the honour of being received, bearing the names of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. We must confess that these three strange names struck us, and it immediately occurred to us that they were but pseudonyms, under which D'Artagnan had disguised names perhaps illustrious, or else the bearers of these borrowed names had themselves chosen them on the day in which, from caprice, discontent, or want of fortune, they had donned the simple musketeer's uniform. From that moment we had no rest till we could find some trace in contemporary works of these extraordinary names which had so strongly awakened our curiosity. The catalogue alone of the books we read with this object would fill a whole chapter, which, although it might be very instructive, would certainly afford our readers but little amusement. It will suffice, then, to tell them that at the moment at which, discouraged by so many fruitless investigations, we were about to abandon our search, we at length found, guided by the counsels of our illustrious friend Paulin Paris, a manuscript in folio, endorsed 4772 or 4773, we do not recollect which, having for title, Memoirs of the Comte de la Fere, touching some events which passed in France toward the end of the reign of King Louis the Thirteenth, and the commencement of the reign of King Louis the Fourteenth, It may be easily imagined how great was our joy when, in turning over this manuscript, our last hope, we found at the twentieth page the name of Athos, at the twenty-seventh the name of Porthos, and at the thirty-first the name of Aramis. The discovery of a completely unknown manuscript at a period in which historical science is carried to such a high degree appeared almost miraculous. We hastened, therefore, to obtain permission to print it, with a view of presenting ourselves some day with the pack of others at the doors of the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, if we should not succeed, a very probable thing, by the by, in gaining ambition to the Académie Française with our own proper pack. This permission, we feel bound to say, was graciously granted which compels us here to give a public contradiction to the slanderers who pretend that we live under a government but moderately indulgent to men of letters. Now, this is the first part of this precious manuscript which we offer to our readers, restoring it to the title which belongs to it, and entering into an engagement that if, of which we have no doubt, this first part should obtain the success it merits, we will publish the second immediately. In the meanwhile, as the godfather is a second father, we beg the reader to lay to our account, 
and not to that of the Comte de la Fere, the pleasure or the ennui he may experience. This being understood, let us proceed with our history. End of Author's Preface Chapter One of The Three Musketeers The Three Presents of D'Artagnan the Elder On the first Monday of the month of April, 1625, the market town of Myung, in which the author of Romance of the Rose was born, appeared to be in as perfect a state of revolution as if the Huguenots had just made a second La Rochelle of it. Many citizens, seeing the women flying toward the high street, leaving their children crying at the open doors, hastened to don the cuirass, and supporting their somewhat uncertain courage with a musket or a partisan, directed their steps toward the hostelry of the jolly miller, before which was gathered, increasing every minute, a compact group, vociferous and full of curiosity. In those times panics were common and few days passed without some city or other registering in its archives an event of this kind. There were nobles who made war against each other, there was the king who made war against the cardinal, there was Spain which made war against the king. Then, in addition to these concealed or public, secret or open wars, there were robbers, mendicants, huguenots, wolves, and scoundrels who made war upon everybody. The citizens always took up arms readily against thieves, wolves, or scoundrels, often against nobles or Huguenots, sometimes against the king, but never against the cardinal or Spain. It resulted then from this habit that on the said first Monday of April, 1625, the citizens, on hearing the clamour, and seeing neither the red and yellow standard nor the livery of the Duc de Richelieu, rushed toward the hostel of the jolly miller. When arrived there, the cause of the hubbub was apparent to all. A young man—we can sketch his portrait at a dash—imagine to yourself a Don Quixote of eighteen, a Don Quixote without his corslet, without his coat of mail, without his cuisses, a Don Quixote clothed in a woollen doublet, the blue colour of which had faded into a nameless shade between lees of wine and heavenly azure face long and brown, high cheekbones, a sign of sagacity, the maxillary muscles enormously developed, an infallible sign by which a Gascon may always be detected, even without his cap, and our young man wore a cap set off with a sort of feather. The eye open and intelligent, the nose hooked but finely chiselled, too big for a youth, too small for a grown man, an experienced eye might have taken him for a farmer's son upon a journey, had it not been for the long sword which, dangling from a leather baldric, hit against the calves of its owner as he walked, and against the rough side of his steed when he was on horseback. For our young man had a steed which was the observed of all observers. It was a bairn pony, from twelve to fourteen years old, yellow in its hide, without a hair in its tail, but not without wind-galls on his legs, which, though going with his head lower than his knees, rendering a martingale quite unnecessary, contrived nevertheless to perform his eight leagues a day. Unfortunately, the qualities of this horse were so well concealed under his strange-coloured hide and his unaccountable gait, that at a time when everybody was a connoisseur in horse-flesh, the appearance of the aforesaid pony at Myung, which place he had entered about a quarter of an hour before, by the gate of Bogency, produced an unfavourable feeling, which extended to his rider. And this feeling had been more painfully perceived by young D'Artagnan, for so was the Don Quixote of this second Rosinante named, from his not being able to conceal from himself the ridiculous appearance that such a steed gave him, good horseman as he was. He had sighed deeply, therefore, when accepting the gift of the pony from Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder. He was not ignorant that such a beast was worth at least twenty livres, and the words which had accompanied the present were above all price. "'My son,' said the old Gascon gentleman, in that pure bairn patois, of which Henry the Fourth could never rid himself, 
This horse was born in the house of your father about thirteen years ago, and has remained in it ever since, which ought to make you love it. Never sell it, allow it to die tranquilly and honourably of old age, and if you make a campaign with it, take as much care of it as you would of an old servant. At court, provided you ever have the honour to go there, continued Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder, an honour to which, remember, your ancient nobility gives you the right. Sustain worthily your name of gentleman, which has been worthily borne by your ancestors for five hundred years, both for your own sake and the sake of those who belong to you. By the latter I mean your relatives and friends. Endure nothing from any one except Monsieur le Cardinal and the King. It is by his courage, please observe, by his courage alone, that a gentleman can make his way nowadays. Whoever hesitates for a second perhaps allows the bait to escape, which during that exact second fortune held out to him. You are young. You ought to be brave for two reasons. The first is that you are a Gascon, and the second is that you are my son. Never fear quarrels, but seek adventures. I have taught you how to handle a sword. You have thews of iron, a wrist of steel. Fight on all occasions. Fight the more for duels being forbidden, since consequently there is twice as much courage in fighting. I have nothing to give you, my son, but fifteen crowns, my horse, and the counsels you have just heard. Your mother will add to them a recipe for a certain balsam, which she had from a bohemian, and which has the miraculous virtue of curing all wounds that do not reach the heart. Take advantage of all, and live happily and long. I have but one word to add, and that is to propose an example to you. Not mine, for I myself have never appeared at court, and have only taken part in religious wars as a volunteer. I speak of Monsieur de Treville, who was formerly my neighbour, and who had the honour to be, as a child, the playfellow of our King Louis the Thirteenth, whom God preserve. Sometimes their play degenerated into battles, and in these battles the king was not always the stronger. The blows which he received increased greatly his esteem and friendship for Monsieur de Treville. Afterward, Monsieur de Treville fought with others. In his first journey to Paris, five times, from the death of the late king till the young one came of age, without reckoning wars and sieges, seven times— and from that date up to the present day, a hundred times, perhaps. So that, in spite of edicts, ordinances, and decrees, there he is, captain of the musketeers, that is to say, chief of a legion of Caesars, whom the king holds in great esteem, and whom the cardinal dreads. He who dreads nothing, as it is said. Still further— Monsieur de Treville gains ten thousand crowns a year. He is therefore a great noble. He began as you begin. Go to him with this letter, and make him your model in order that you may do as he has done. Upon which Monsieur d'Artagnan the elder girded his own sword round his son, kissed him tenderly on both cheeks, and gave him his benediction. On leaving the paternal chamber the young man found his mother— who was waiting for him with the famous recipe of which the counsels we have just repeated would necessitate frequent employment. The adieu were on this side longer and more tender than they had been on the other. Not that Monsieur d'Artagnan did not love his son, who was his only offspring, but Monsieur d'Artagnan was a man, and he would have considered it unworthy of a man to give way to his feelings, whereas Madame d'Artagnan was a woman and still more, a mother. She wept abundantly, and, let us speak it to the praise of Monsieur d'Artagnan the Younger, notwithstanding the efforts he made to remain firm, as a future musketeer ought, nature prevailed, and he shed many tears, of which he succeeded with great difficulty in concealing the half. The same day the man set forward on his journey, furnished with the three paternal gifts, 
which consisted, as we have said, of fifteen crowns, the horse, and the letter for Monsieur de Treville, the counsels being thrown into the bargain. With such a vade mecum, D'Artagnan was morally and physically an exact copy of the hero of Cervantes, to whom we so happily compared him when our duty of an historian placed us under the necessity of sketching his portrait. Don Quixote took windmills for giants, and sheep for armies. D'Artagnan took every smile for an insult, and every look as a provocation. Whence it resulted that, from Tarb to Mung, his fist was constantly doubled, or his hand on the hilt of his sword, and yet the fist did not descend upon any jaw, nor did the sword issue from its scabbard. It was not that the sight of the wretched pony did not excite numerous smiles on the countenances of passers-by, but as against the side of this pony rattled a sword of respectable length, and as over this sword gleamed an eye rather ferocious than haughty, these passers-by repressed their hilarity, or if hilarity prevailed over prudence, they endeavoured to laugh only on one side, like the masks of the ancients. D'Artagnan then remained majestic and intact in his susceptibility, till he came to this unlucky city of Myung. But there, as he was alighting from his horse at the gate of the jolly miller, without any one, host, waiter, or hostler, coming to hold his stirrup or take his horse, D'Artagnan spied through an open window on the ground floor a gentleman, well made and of good carriage although of rather a stern countenance, talking with two persons who appeared to listen to him with respect. D'Artagnan fancied quite naturally, according to his custom, that he must be the object of their conversation, and listened. This time D'Artagnan was only in part mistaken. He himself was not in question, but his horse was. The gentleman appeared to be enumerating all his qualities to his auditors, and, as I have said, the auditors seemed to have great deference for the narrator. They every moment burst into fits of laughter. Now, as a half-smile was sufficient to awake the irascibility of the young man, the effect produced upon him by this vociferous mirth may be easily imagined. Nevertheless, D'Artagnan was desirous of examining the appearance of this impertinent personage who ridiculed him. He fixed his haughty eye upon the stranger and perceived a man of from forty to forty-five years of age, with black and piercing eyes, pale complexion, a strongly marked nose, and a black and well-shaped moustache. He was dressed in a doublet and hose of a violet colour, with aiguillettes of the same colour, without any other ornaments than the customary slashes through which the shirt appeared. This doublet and hose, though new, were creased, like travelling clothes for a long time packed in a portmanteau. D'Artagnan made all these remarks with the rapidity of a most minute observer, and doubtless from an instinctive feeling that this stranger was destined to have a great influence over his future life. Now, as at the moment in which D'Artagnan fixed his eyes upon the gentleman in the violet doublet, the gentleman made one of his most knowing and profound remarks respecting the Baronet's pody. His two auditors laughed even louder than before, and he himself, though contrary to his custom, allowed a pale smile, if I may be allowed to use such an expression, to stray over his countenance. This time there could be no doubt. D'Artagnan was really insulted. Full, then, of this conviction, he pulled his cap down over his eyes, and endeavouring to copy some of the court airs he had picked up in Gascony among young travelling nobles, he advanced with one hand on the hilt of his sword, and the other resting on his hip. Unfortunately, as he advanced, his anger increased at every step, and instead of the proper and lofty speech he had prepared as a prelude to his challenge, he found nothing at the tip of his tongue but a gross personality, which he accompanied with a furious gesture. "'I say, sir, you, sir, who are hiding yourself behind that shutter, "'Yes, you, sir. Tell me what you are laughing at, and we will laugh together.' The gentleman raised his eyes slowly from the nag to his cavalier, 
as if he required some time to ascertain whether it could be to him that such strange reproaches were addressed. Then, when he could not possibly entertain any doubt of the matter, his eyebrows slightly bent, and with an accent of irony and insolence impossible to be described, he replied to D'Artagnan, "'I was not speaking to you, sir.' "'But I am speaking to you!' replied the young man, additionally exasperated with this mixture of insolence and good manners, of politeness and scorn. The stranger looked at him again with a slight smile, and, retiring from the window, came out of the hostelry with a slow step, and placed himself before the horse, within two paces of D'Artagnan. His quiet manner, and the ironical expression of his countenance, redoubled the mirth of the persons with whom he had been talking, and who still remained at the window. D'Artagnan, seeing him approach, drew his sword a foot out of the scabbard. "'This horse is decidedly, or rather has been in his youth, a buttercup,' resumed the stranger, continuing the remarks he had begun, and addressing himself to his auditors at the window, without paying the least attention to the exasperation of D'Artagnan, who, however, placed himself between him and them. "'It is a colour very well known in botany, but till the present time very rare among horses.' "'There are people who laugh at the horse that would not dare to laugh at the master,' cried the young emulator of the furious Treville. "'I do not often laugh, sir,' replied the stranger, "'as you may perceive by the expression of my countenance. But nevertheless I retain the privilege of laughing when I please.' "'And I,' cried D'Artagnan, "'will allow no man to laugh when it displeases me.' "'Indeed, sir,' continued the stranger, more calm than ever. "'Well, that is perfectly right.' And turning on his heel, was about to re-enter the hostelry by the front gate, beneath which D'Artagnan on arriving had observed a saddled horse. But D'Artagnan was not of a character to allow a man to escape him thus, who had the insolence to ridicule him. He drew his sword entirely from the scabbard and followed him, crying— "'Turn, turn, Master Joker, lest I strike you behind.' "'Strike me,' said the other, turning on his heels, and surveying the young man with as much astonishment as contempt. "'Why, my good fellow, you must be mad.' Then, in a suppressed tone, as if speaking to himself, "'This is annoying,' continued he. "'What a godsend this would be for His Majesty, who is seeking everywhere for brave fellows to recruit for his musketeers.' He had scarcely finished when D'Artagnan made such a furious lunge at him that if he had not sprung nimbly backward, it is probable he would have jested for the last time. The stranger, then perceiving that the matter went beyond raillery, drew his sword, saluted his adversary, and seriously placed himself on guard. But at the same moment his two auditors, accompanied by the host, fell upon D'Artagnan with sticks, shovels, and tongs. This caused so rapid and complete a diversion from the attack that D'Artagnan's adversary, while the latter turned round to face this shower of blows, sheathed his sword with the same precision, and instead of an actor, which he had nearly been, became a spectator of the fight, a part in which he acquitted himself with his usual impassiveness, muttering nevertheless, "'A plague upon these Gascons! Replace him on his orange horse, and let him be gone!' "'Not before I have killed you, poltroon!' cried D'Artagnan, taking the best face possible, and never retreating one step before his three assailants, who continued to shower blows upon him. "'Another Gasconade,' murmured the gentleman. "'By my honour, these Gascons are incorrigible. Keep up the dance, then, since he will have it so. When he is tired, he will perhaps tell us that he has had enough of it.' But the stranger knew not the headstrong personage he had to do with. D'Artagnan was not the man ever to cry for quarter. The fight was therefore prolonged for some seconds, but at length D'Artagnan dropped his sword, which was broken in two pieces by the blow of a stick. Another blow full upon his forehead at the same moment brought him to the ground, covered with blood and almost fainting. It was at this moment that people came flocking to the scene of action from all sides. 
the host, fearful of consequences, with the help of his servants carried the wounded man into the kitchen, where some trifling attentions were bestowed upon him. As to the gentleman, he resumed his place at the window, and surveyed the crowd with a certain impatience, evidently annoyed by their remaining undispersed. "'Well, how is it with this madman?' exclaimed he, turning round as the noise of the door announced the entrance of the host, who came in to inquire if he was unhurt. "'Your Excellency is safe and sound?' asked the host. "'Oh, yes, perfectly safe and sound, my good host, and I wish to know what has become of our young man.' "'He is better,' said the host. "'He fainted quite away.' "'Indeed,' said the gentleman." But before he fainted, he collected all his strength to challenge you, and to defy you while challenging you. "'Why, this fellow must be the devil in person!' cried the stranger. "'Oh, no, your excellency, he is not the devil,' replied the host, with a grin of contempt. "'For during his fainting we rummaged his valise, and found nothing but a clean shirt and eleven crowns, which, however, did not prevent his saying, as he was fainting, that if such a thing had happened in Paris, you should have cause to repent of it at a later period. Then, said the stranger coolly, he must be some prince in disguise. "'I have told you this, good sir,' resumed the host, "'in order that you may be on your guard.' Did he name no one in his passion? Yes, he struck his pocket and said, "'We shall see what Monsieur de Treville will think of this insult.' offered to his protégé. "'Monsieur de Treville,' said the stranger, becoming attentive. "'He put his hand upon his pocket while pronouncing the name of Monsieur de Treville? Now, my dear host, while your young man was insensible, you did not fail, I am quite sure, to ascertain what that pocket contained. What was there in it?' "'A letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the musketeers.' "'Indeed!' "'Exactly as I have the honour to tell your Excellency.' The host, who was not endowed with great perspicacity, did not observe the expression which his words had given to the physiognomy of the stranger. The latter rose from the front of the window, upon the sill of which he had leaned with his elbow, and knit his brow like a man disquieted. "'The devil!' murmured he between his teeth. "'Can Treville have set this Gascon upon me?' He is very young, but a sword-thrust is a sword-thrust, whatever be the age of him who gives it, and a youth is less to be suspected than an older man. And the stranger fell into a reverie which lasted some minutes. A weak obstacle is sometimes sufficient to overthrow a great design. Host, said he, could you not contrive to get rid of this frantic boy for me? "'In conscience I cannot kill him, and yet,' added he, with a coldly menacing expression, "'he annoys me. Where is he?' "'In my wife's chamber, on the first flight, where they are dressing his wounds. "'His things and his bag are with him. Has he taken off his doublet? "'On the contrary, everything is in the kitchen. "'But if he annoys you, this young fool, to be sure he does.' He causes a disturbance in your hostelry, which respectable people cannot put up with. Go, make out my bill, and notify my servant. What, monsieur, will you leave us so soon? You know that very well, as I gave my order to saddle my horse. Have they not obeyed me? It is done. As your excellency may have observed, your horse is in the great gateway, ready saddled for your departure. That is well. Do as I have directed you, then. What the devil! said the host to himself. Can he be afraid of this boy? But an imperious glance from the stranger stopped him short. He bowed humbly and retired. It is not necessary for Milady to be seen by this fellow, continued the stranger. Footnote. We are well aware that this term, Milady, is only properly used when followed by a family name, but we find it thus in the manuscript, and we do not choose to take upon ourselves to alter it. End of footnote. She will soon pass. She is already late. 
I had better get on horseback and go and meet her. I should like to know what this letter addressed to Treville contains. And the stranger, muttering to himself, directed his steps towards the kitchen. In the meantime, the host, who entertained no doubt that it was the presence of the young man that drove the stranger from his hostelry, reascended to his wife's chamber, and found D'Artagnan just recovering his senses. Giving him to understand that the police would deal with him pretty severely for having sought a quarrel with a great lord, for in the opinion of the host, the stranger could be nothing less than a great lord. He insisted that, notwithstanding his weakness, D'Artagnan should get up and depart as quickly as possible. D'Artagnan, half stupefied, without his doublet, and with his head bound up in a linen cloth, arose then, and, urged by the host, began to descend the stairs. But on arriving at the kitchen the first thing he saw was his antagonist talking calmly at the step of a heavy carriage drawn by two large Norman horses. His interlocutor, whose head appeared through the carriage window, was a woman of from twenty to two-and-twenty years. We have already observed with what rapidity D'Artagnan seized the expression of a countenance. He perceived then, at a glance, that this woman was young and beautiful, and her style of beauty struck him more forcibly from its being totally different from that of the southern countries in which D'Artagnan had hitherto resided. She was pale and fair, with long curls falling in profusion over her shoulders, had large, blue, languishing eyes, rosy lips, and hands of alabaster. She was talking with great animation with a stranger. "'His eminence then orders me,' said the lady, "'to return instantly to England, and to inform him as soon as the Duke leaves London.' "'And as to my other instructions?' asked the fair traveller. "'They are contained in this box, which you will not open until you are on the other side of the channel.' "'Very well. And you? What will you do?' "'I. I return to Paris.' "'What, without chastising this insolent boy?' asked the lady. The stranger was about to reply, but at the moment he opened his mouth, D'Artagnan, who had heard all, precipitated himself over the threshold of the door. "'This insolent boy chastises others,' cried he, "'and I hope that this time he whom he ought to chastise will not escape him as before.' "'Will not escape him?' replied the stranger, knitting his brow. "'No, before a woman you would dare not fly, I presume.' "'Remember,' said Milady, seeing the stranger lay his hand on his sword, "'the least delay may ruin everything.' "'You are right,' cried the gentleman. "'Be gone, then, on your part, and I will depart as quickly on mine.' And bowing to the lady, he sprang into his saddle, while her coachman applied his whip vigorously to his horses. The two interlocutors thus separated, taking opposite directions at full gallop. "'Pay him, booby!' cried the stranger to his servant, without checking the speed of his horse, and the man, after throwing two or three silver pieces at the foot of mine host, galloped after his master. "'Base coward! False gentleman!' cried D'Artagnan, springing forward in his turn after the servant." but his wound had rendered him too weak to support such an exertion. Scarcely had he gone ten steps when his ears began to tingle, a faintness seized him, a cloud of blood passed over his eyes, and he fell in the middle of the street, crying still, "'Coward! Coward! Coward!' "'He is a coward, indeed,' grumbled the host, drawing near to D'Artagnan, and endeavouring by this little flattery to make up matters with the young man, as the heron of the fable did with the snail he had despised the evening before. "'Yes, a base coward,' murmured D'Artagnan. "'But she, she was very beautiful.' "'What she?' demanded the host. "'Milady,' faltered D'Artagnan, and fainted a second time. "'Ah, it's all one,' said the host. "'I have lost two customers, but this one remains.' of whom I am pretty certain for some days to come. There will be eleven crowns gained. It is to be remembered that eleven crowns was just the sum that remained in D'Artagnan's purse. 
the host had reckoned upon eleven days of confinement at a crown a day. But he had reckoned without his guest. On the following morning at five o'clock D'Artagnan arose, and descending to the kitchen without help, asked, among other ingredients the list of which has not come down to us, for some oil, some wine, and some rosemary, and with his mother's recipe in his hand, composed a balsam with which he anointed his numerous wounds, replacing his bandages himself, and positively refusing the assistance of any doctor. D'Artagnan walked about that same evening, and was almost cured by the morrow. But when the time came to pay for his rosemary, this oil and the wine, the only expense the master had incurred, as he had preserved a strict abstinence, while on the contrary the yellow horse, by the account of the hostler at least, had eaten three times as much as a horse of his size could reasonably be supposed to have done, D'Artagnan found nothing in his pocket but his little old velvet purse with the eleven crowns it contained, for as to the letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, it had disappeared. The young man commenced his search for the letter with the greatest patience, turning out his pockets of all kinds over and over again, rummaging and re-rummaging in his valise, and opening and reopening his purse. But when he found that he had come to the conviction that the letter was not to be found, he flew for the third time into such a rage as was near costing him a fresh consumption of wine, oil, and rosemary. For upon seeing this hot-headed youth become exasperated, and threatened to destroy everything in the establishment if his letter were not found, the host seized a spit, his wife a broom-handle, and the servants the same sticks they had used the day before. "'My letter of recommendation!' cried D'Artagnan. "'My letter of recommendation! Or, the holy blood, I will spit you all like ortolans!' Unfortunately, there was one circumstance which created a powerful obstacle to the accomplishment of this threat, which was, as we have related, that his sword had been in his first conflict broken in two, and which he had entirely forgotten. Hence it resulted when D'Artagnan proceeded to draw his sword in earnest, he found himself purely and simply armed with a stump of a sword about eight or ten inches in length, which the host had carefully placed in the scabbard. As to the rest of the blade, the master had slyly put that on one side to make himself a larding-pin. But this deception would probably not have stopped our fiery young man, if the host had not reflected that the reclamation which his guest made was perfectly just. "'But, after all,' said he, lowering the point of his spit, "'where is this letter?' "'Yes, where is this letter?' cried D'Artagnan. "'In the first place I warn you that that letter is for Monsieur de Treville, and it must be found, or if it is not found he will know how to find it.' His threat completed the intimidation of the host. After the king and the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville was the man whose name was perhaps most frequently repeated by the military, and even by citizens. There was, to be sure, Father Joseph— but his name was never pronounced but with a subdued voice. Such was the terror inspired by his grey eminence, as the cardinal's familiar was called. Throwing down his spit and ordering his wife to do the same with her broom-handle, and the servants with their sticks, he set the first example of commencing an earnest search for the lost letter. "'Does the letter contain anything valuable?' demanded the host, after a few minutes of useless investigation. "'Zounds! I think it does indeed!' cried the Gascon, who reckoned upon this letter for making his way at court. "'It contained my fortune!' "'Bills upon Spain?' asked the disturbed host. "'Bills upon His Majesty's private treasury!' answered D'Artagnan, who, reckoning upon entering into the King's service in consequence of this recommendation, believed he could make this somewhat hazardous reply without telling of a falsehood. "'The devil!' cried the host, at his wit's end. "'But it's of no importance,' continued D'Artagnan, with natural assurance. "'It's of no importance. The money is nothing. That letter was everything. I would rather have lost a thousand pistoles than have lost it.' He would not have risked more if he had said twenty thousand, but a certain juvenile modesty restrained him. 
a ray of light all at once broke upon the mind of the host as he was giving himself to the devil upon finding nothing. "'That letter is not lost!' cried he. "'What?' cried D'Artagnan. "'No, it has been stolen from you.' "'Stolen? By whom?' "'By the gentleman who was here yesterday. He came down into the kitchen where your doublet was. He remained there some time alone. I would lay a wager he has stolen it.' "'Do you think so?' answered D'Artagnan, but little convinced, as he knew better than any one else how entirely personal the value of this letter was, and saw nothing in it likely to tempt cupidity. The fact was that none of his servants, none of the travellers present, could have gained anything by being possessed of this paper. "'Do you say,' resumed D'Artagnan, "'that you suspect that impertinent gentleman?' "'I tell you I am sure of it,' continued the host. "'When I informed him that your lordship was the protégé of Monsieur de Treville, and that you even had a letter for that illustrious gentleman, he appeared to be very much disturbed, and asked me where that letter was, and immediately came down into the kitchen where he knew your doublet was.' "'Then that's my thief,' replied D'Artagnan. "'I will complain to Monsieur de Treville.' and Monsieur de Treville will complain to the king. He then drew two crowns majestically from his purse, and gave them to the host, who accompanied him, cap in hand, to the gate, and remounted his yellow horse, which bore him without any further accident to the gate of Saint Antoine at Paris, where his owners sold him for three crowns, which was a very good price, considering that D'Artagnan had ridden him hard during the last stage. Thus the dealer to whom D'Artagnan sold him for the nine livres did not conceal from the young man that he only gave that enormous sum for him on the account of the originality of his color. Thus D'Artagnan entered Paris on foot, carrying his little packet under his arm, and walked about till he found an apartment to be let on terms suited to the scantiness of his means. This chamber was a sort of garret, situated in the Rue des Fossoyeurs, near the Luxembourg. As soon as the earnest money was paid, D'Artagnan took possession of his lodging, and passed the remainder of the day in sewing onto his doublet and hose some ornamental braiding which his mother had taken off an almost new doublet of the elder Monsieur d'Artagnan, and which she had given her son secretly. Next he went to the Quai de Ferret to have a new blade put to his sword and then returned toward the Louvre, inquiring of the first musketeer he met for the situation of the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, which proved to be in the Rue de Vieux Colombier, that is to say, in the immediate vicinity of the chamber hired by D'Artagnan, a circumstance which appeared to furnish a happy augury for the success of his journey. After this, satisfied with the way in which he had conducted himself at Meung, Without remorse for the past, confident in the present, and full of hope for the future, he retired to bed and slept the sleep of the brave. This sleep, provincial as it was, brought him to nine o'clock in the morning, at which hour he rose in order to repair to the residence of Monsieur de Treville, the third personage in the kingdom, in the paternal estimation. End of chapter 1 Chapter Two of The Three Musketeers, The Antechamber of Monsieur de Treville. Monsieur de Troisville, as his family was still called in Gascony, or Monsieur de Treville, as he has ended by styling himself in Paris, had really commenced life as D'Artagnan now did, that is to say, without a sou in his pocket, but with a fund of audacity, shrewdness, and intelligence which makes the poorest Gascon gentleman often derive more in his hope from the paternal inheritance than the richest Paragordian or Barrican gentleman derives in reality from his. His insolent bravery, his still more insolent success at a time when blows poured down like hail, had borne him to the top of that difficult ladder called court favour, which he had climbed four steps at a time. He was the friend of the king, who honoured highly, as every one knows, the memory of his father, Henry the Fourth, 
the father of Monsieur de Treville had served him so faithfully in his wars against the League that in default of money, a thing to which the baronet was accustomed all his life, and who constantly paid his debts with that of which he never stood in need of borrowing, that is to say, with ready wit, in default of money, we repeat, he authorized him, after the reduction of Paris, to assume for his arms a golden lion passant upon gules, with the motto, Fidelis e Fortis. This was a great matter in the way of honour, but very little in the way of wealth, so that when the illustrious companion of the great Henry died, the only inheritance he was able to leave his son was his sword and his motto. Thanks to this double gift and the spotless name that accompanied it, M. de Treville was admitted into the household of the young prince, where he made such good use of his sword, and was so faithful to his motto, that Louis the Thirteenth, one of the good blades of his kingdom, was accustomed to say that if he had a friend who was about to fight, he would advise him to choose as a second, himself first, and Treville next, or even perhaps before himself. Thus Louis the Thirteenth had a real liking for Treville a royal liking, a self-interested liking, it is true, but still a liking. At that unhappy period it was an important consideration to be surrounded by such men as Treville. Many might take for their device the epithet strong, which formed the second part of his motto, but very few gentlemen could lay claim to the faithful which constituted the first. Treville was one of these latter. His was one of those rare organizations, endowed with an obedient intelligence like that of the dog, with a blind valour, a quick eye, and a prompt hand, to whom sight appeared only to be given to see if the king were dissatisfied with any one, and the hand to strike this displeasing personage, whether a Besme, a Morevers, a Potiot de Mer, or a Vitry. In short, up to this period nothing had been wanting to Treville but opportunity. But he was ever on the watch for it, and he faithfully promised himself that he would not fail to seize it by its three hairs whenever it came within reach of his hand. At last Louis the Thirteenth made Treville the captain of his musketeers, who were to Louis the Thirteenth in devotedness, or rather in fanaticism, what his ordinaries had been to Henry the Third and his Scotch guard to Louis the Eleventh. On his part, the cardinal was not behind the king in this respect. When he saw the formidable and chosen body with which Louis the Thirteenth had surrounded himself, this second, or rather this first king of France, became desirous that he too should have his guard. He had his musketeers, therefore, as Louis the Thirteenth had his, and these two powerful rivals vied with each other in procuring, not only from all the provinces of France, but even from all foreign states, the most celebrated swordsmen. It was not uncommon for Richelieu and Louis the Thirteenth to dispute over their evening game of chess upon the merits of their servants. Each boasted the bearing and the courage of his own people. While exclaiming loudly against duels and brawls, they excited them secretly to quarrel, deriving an immoderate satisfaction or genuine regret from the success or defeat of their own combatants. We learn this from the memoirs of a man who was concerned in some few of these defeats, and in many of these victories. Treville had grasped the weak side of his master, and it was to this address that he owed the long and constant favour of a king who has not left the reputation behind him of being very faithful in his friendships. He paraded his musketeers before the Cardinal Armand du Plessis with an insolent air which made the grey moustache of his eminence curl with ire. Treville understood admirably the war method of that period, in which he who could not live at the expense of the enemy must live at the expense of his compatriots. His soldiers formed a legion of devil-may-care fellows, perfectly undisciplined toward all but himself. Loose, half-drunk, imposing, the king's musketeers, or rather, Monsieur de Treville's, spread themselves about in the cabarets, in the public walks, and in the public sports, 
shouting, twisting their moustaches, clanking their swords, and taking great pleasure in annoying the guards of the cardinal whenever they could fall in with them. Then drawing in the open streets, as if it were the best of all possible sports. Sometimes killed, but sure in that case to be both wept and avenged. Often killing others, but then certain of not rotting in prison, Monsieur de Treville being there to claim them. Thus Monsieur de Treville was praised to the highest note by these men, who adored him, and who, ruffians as they were, trembled before him like scholars before their master, obedient to his least word, and ready to sacrifice themselves to wash out the smallest insult. Monsieur de Treville employed this powerful weapon for the king, in the first place, and the friends of the king, and then for himself and his own friends. For the rest, in the memoirs of this period, which has left so many memoirs, one does not find this worthy gentleman blamed even by his enemies, and he had many such among men of the pen as well as among men of the sword. In no instance, let us say, was this worthy gentleman accused of deriving personal advantage from the cooperation of his minions. Endowed with a rare genius for intrigue, which rendered him the equal of the ablest intriguers, he remained an honest man. Still further, in spite of sword thrusts which weaken, and painful exercises which fatigue, he had become one of the most gallant frequenters of revels, one of the most insinuating ladies' men, one of the softest whisperers of interesting nothings of his day. The bonne fortune of de Treville were talked of as those of Monsieur de Bassompierre had been talked of twenty years before, and that was not saying a little. The captain of the musketeers was therefore admired, feared, and loved and this constitutes the zenith of human fortune. Louis the Fourteenth absorbed all the smaller stars of his court in his own vast radiance, but his father, a son pluribus impar, left his personal splendour to each of his favourites, his individual value to each of his courtiers. In addition to the leaves of the king and the cardinal, there might be reckoned in Paris at that time more than two hundred smaller but still noteworthy leaves. Among these two hundred leaves, that of Treville was one of the most sought. The court of his hotel, situated in the Rue de Vieux Colombier, resembled a camp from by six o'clock in the morning in summer and eight o'clock in winter. From fifty to sixty musketeers, who appeared to replace one another in order always to present an imposing number, paraded constantly, armed to the teeth and ready for anything. On one of those immense staircases, upon whose space modern civilization would build a hold house, ascended and descended the office-seekers of Paris, who ran after any sort of favour, gentlemen from the provinces anxious to be enrolled, and servants in all sorts of liveries, bringing and carrying messages between their masters and Monsieur de Treville. In the antechamber, upon long circular benches, reposed the elect, that is to say, those who were called. In this apartment a continued buzzing prevailed from morning till night, while Monsieur de Treville, in his office contiguous to this antechamber, received visits, listened to complaints, gave his orders, and like the king in his balcony at the Louvre, had only to place himself at the window to review both his men and arms. The day on which D'Artagnan presented himself, the assemblage was imposing, particularly for a provincial just arriving from his province. It is true that this provincial was a Gascon, and that, particularly at this period, the compatriots of D'Artagnan had the reputation of not being easily intimidated, when he had once passed the massive door, covered with long square-headed nails, he fell into the midst of a troop of swordsmen, who crossed one another in their passage, calling out, quarrelling, and playing tricks one with another. In order to make one's way amid these turbulent and conflicting waves, it was necessary to be an officer, a great noble, or a pretty woman. 
it was then into the midst of this tumult and disorder that our young man advanced with a beating heart ranging his long rapier up his lanky leg and keeping one hand on the edge of his cap with that half-smile of the embarrassed provincial who wishes to put on a good face when he had passed one group he began to breathe more freely but he could not help observing that they turned round to look at him and for the first time in his life d'artagnan who had till that day entertained a very good opinion of himself felt ridiculous arrived at the staircase it was still worse there were four musketeers on the bottom steps amusing themselves with the following exercise while ten or twelve of their comrades waited upon the landing-place to make their turn in the sport one of them stationed upon the top stair naked sword in hand prevented or at least endeavoured to prevent the three others from ascending these three others fenced against him with their agile swords d'artagnan at first took these weapons for foils and believed them to be buttoned but he soon perceived by certain scratches that every weapon was pointed and sharpened and that at each of these scratches not only the spectators but even the actors themselves laughed like so many madmen he who at the moment occupied the upper step kept his adversaries marvellously in check a circle was formed around them the conditions required that at every hit the man touch should quit the game yielding his turn for the benefit of the adversary who had hit him in five minutes three were slightly wounded one on the hand another on the ear by the defender of the stair who himself remained intact a piece of skill which was worth to him according to the rules agreed upon three turns of favour however difficult it might be or rather as he pretended it was to astonish our young traveller this pastime really astonished him he had seen in his province that land in which heads became so easily heated a few of the preliminaries of duels but the daring of these four fencers appeared to him the strongest he had ever heard of even in gascony he believed himself transported into that famous country of giants into which gulliver afterward went and was so frightened and yet he had not gained the goal for there were still the landing-place and the antechamber on the landing they were no longer fighting but amused themselves with stories about women and in the antechamber with stories about the court on the landing d'artagnan blushed in the antechamber he trembled his warm and fickle imagination which in gascony had rendered him formidable to young chambermaids and even sometimes their mistresses had never dreamed even in moments of delirium of half the amorous wonders or a quarter of the feats of gallantry which were here set forth in connection with names the best known and with details the least concealed but if his morals were shocked on the landing his respect for the cardinal was scandalized in the antechamber there to his great astonishment d'artagnan heard the policy which made all europe tremble criticized aloud and openly as well as the private life of the cardinal which so many great nobles had been punished for trying to pry into that great man who was so revered by d'artagnan the elder served as an object of ridicule to the musketeers of treville who cracked their jokes upon his bandy legs and his crooked back some sang ballads about madame d'aguillon his mistress and madame cambalet his niece while others formed parties and plans to annoy the pages and guards of the cardinal duke all things which appeared to d'artagnan monstrous impossibilities nevertheless when the name of the king was now and then uttered unthinkingly amid all these cardinal jests a sort of gag seemed to close for a moment on all these jeering mouths they looked hesitatingly around them and appeared to doubt the thickness of the partition between them and the office of monsieur de treville but a fresh allusion soon brought back the conversation to his eminence and then the laughter recovered its loudness and the light was not withheld from any of his actions certes these fellows will all either be imprisoned or hanged 
thought the terrified d'artagnan and i no doubt with them for from the moment i have either listened to or heard them i shall be held as an accomplice what would my good father say who so strongly pointed out to me the respect due to the cardinal if he knew i was in the society of such pagans we have no need therefore to say that d'artagnan dared not join in the conversation only he looked with all his eyes and listened with all his ears stretched his five senses so as to lose nothing and despite his confidence on the paternal admonitions he felt himself carried by his tastes and led by his instincts to praise rather than to blame the unheard of things which were taking place although he was a perfect stranger in the court of monsieur de treville's courtiers and this his first appearance in that place he was at length noticed and somebody came and asked him what he wanted at this demand d'artagnan gave his name very modestly emphasized the title of compatriot and begged the servant who had put the question to him to request a moment's audience of monsieur de treville a request which the other with an air of protection promised to transmit in due season d'artagnan a little recovered from his first surprise had now leisure to study costumes and physiognomy the centre of the most animated group was a musketeer of great height and haughty countenance dressed in a costume so peculiar as to attract general attention he did not wear the uniform cloak which was not obligatory at that epoch of less liberty but more independence but a cerulean blue doublet a little faded and worn and over this a magnificent baldric worked in gold which shone like water ripples in the sun a long cloak of crimson velvet fell in graceful folds from his shoulders disclosing in front the splendid baldric from which was suspended a gigantic rapier this musketeer had just come off guard complained of having a cold and coughed from time to time affectedly it was for this reason as he said to those around him that he had put on his cloak and while he spoke with a lofty air and twisted his moustache disdainfully all admired his embroidered baldric and d'artagnan more than any one what would you have said the musketeer this fashion is coming in it is a folly i admit but still it is the fashion besides one must lay out one's inheritance somehow ah porthos cried one of his companions don't try to make us believe you obtained that baldric by paternal generosity it was given to you by that veiled lady i met you with the other sunday near the gate saint honneur no upon honour and by the faith of a gentleman i bought it with the contents of my own purse answered he whom they designated by the name porthos yes about in the same manner said another musketeer that i bought this new purse with what my mistress put into the old one <laughs> it's true though said porthos and the proof is that i paid twelve pistoles for it the wonder was increased although the doubt continued to exist is it not true aramis said porthos turning toward another musketeer this other musketeer formed a perfect contrast to his interrogator who had just designated him by the name of aramis he was a stout man of about two or three and twenty with an open ingenuous countenance a black mild eye and cheeks rosy and downy as an autumn peach his delicate moustache marked a perfectly straight line upon his upper lip he appeared to dread to lower his hands lest their veins should swell and he pinched the tips of his ears from time to time to preserve their delicate pink transparency habitually he spoke little and slowly bowed frequently laughed without noise showing his teeth which were fine and of which as the rest of his person he appeared to take great care he answered the appeal of his friend by an affirmative nod of the head this affirmation appeared to dispel all doubts with regard to the baldric they continued to admire it but said no more about it and with a rapid change of thought 
the conversation passed suddenly to another subject. "'What do you think of the story Chalet's Esquire relates?' asked another musketeer, without addressing any one in particular, but on the contrary speaking to everybody. "'And what does he say?' asked Porthos, in a self-sufficient tone. "'He relates that he met at Brussels, Roquefort, the âme damnée of the cardinal disguised as a capuchin, and that this curse Rochefort, thanks to his disguise, had tricked Monsieur de Legue, like a ninny as he is.' "'A oh, ninny, indeed,' said Porthos. "'But is the matter certain?' "'I had it from Aramis,' replied the musketeer. "'Indeed.' "'Why, you knew it, Porthos,' said Aramis. "'I told you of it yesterday. Let us say no more about it.' "'Say no more about it? <laughs> That's your opinion,' replied Porthos. "'Say no more about it? Pissed! You come to your conclusions quickly. What? The cardinal sets a spy upon a gentleman? Has his letters stolen from him by means of a traitor? A brigand? A rascal? Has, with the help of this spy, and thanks to this correspondence, Chalet's throat cut? Under the stupid pretext that he wanted to kill the king and marry monsieur to the queen? Nobody knew a word of this enigma. You unravelled it yesterday to the great satisfaction of all. And while we are still gaping with wonder at the news, you come and tell us today, let us say no more about it. Well, then, let us talk about it, since you desire it, replied Aramis patiently. This Roquefort, cried Porthos, if I were the esquire of poor Chalet, should pass a minute or two very uncomfortably with me. "'And you, you would rather pass a sad quarter-hour with the Red Duke,' replied Aramis. "'Oh, the Red Duke! Bravo, bravo! The Red Duke!' cried Porthos, clapping his hands and nodding his head. "'The Red Duke is capital! I'll circulate that saying, be assured, my dear fellow. Who says this Aramis is not a wit? What a misfortune it is you did not follow your first vocation! What a delicious abbé you would have made! Oh, it's only a temporary postponement, replied Aramis. I shall be one some day. You very well know, Porthos, that I continue to study theology for that purpose. He will be one, as he says, cried Porthos. He will be one sooner or later. Sooner, said Aramis. He only waits for one thing to determine him to resume his cassock, which hangs behind his uniform, said another musketeer. What is he waiting for? asked another. Only till the queen has given an heir to the crown of France. No jesting upon that subject, gentlemen, said Porthos. Thank God the queen is still of an age to give one. They say that Monsieur de Buckingham is in France replied Aramis, with a significant smile which gave to this sentence, apparently so simple, a tolerably scandalous meaning. "'Aramis, my good friend, this time you are wrong,' interrupted Porthos. "'Your wit is always leading you beyond bounds. If Monsieur de Treville heard you, you would repent of speaking thus.' "'Are you going to give me a lesson, Porthos?' cried Aramis, from whose usually mild eye a flash passed like lightning. "'My dear fellow, be a musketeer or be an abbé. Be one or the other, but not both,' replied Porthos. "'You know what Athos told you the other day. You eat at everybody's mess. Ah, don't be angry, I beg of you, that would be useless. You know what is agreed upon between you, Athos, and me. You go to Madame d'Aguillon's and you pay your court to her. You go to Madame de bois the cousin of Madame de Chevreuse, and you pass for being far advanced in the good graces of that lady. Oh, good Lord! Don't trouble yourself to reveal your good luck. No one asks for your secret. All the world knows your discretion. But since you possess that virtue, why the devil don't you make use of it with respect to Her Majesty?' Let whoever likes talk of the king and the cardinal, and how he likes, but the queen is sacred, 
and if anyone speaks of her, let it be respectfully. Porthos, you're as vain as Narcissus, I plainly tell you so, replied Aramis. You know I hate moralizing, except when it is done by Athos. As to you, good sir, you wear too magnificent a baldric to be strong on that head. I will be an abbe, if it suits me. In the meanwhile, I am a musketeer. In that quality I say what I please, and at this moment it pleases me to say that you weary me. Aramis! Porthos! Gentlemen, gentlemen! cried the surrounding group. Monsieur de Treville awaits Monsieur d'Artagnan, cried a servant, throwing open the door of the cabinet. At this announcement, during which the door remained open, everyone became mute, and amid the general silence the young man crossed part of the length of the antechamber and entered the apartment of the captain of the musketeers, congratulating himself with all his heart at having so narrowly escaped the end of this strange quarrel. End of chapter. Chapter three of the Three Musketeers. The audience. Monsieur de Treville was at the moment in rather ill humour. Nevertheless, he saluted the young man politely, who bowed to the very ground, and he smiled on receiving D'Artagnan's response. The baronet's accent of which recalled to him at the same time his youth and his country, a double remembrance which makes a man smile at all ages. But stepping toward the antechamber, and making a sign to D'Artagnan with his hand, as if to ask his permission to finish with others before he began with him, he called three lines, with a louder voice at each time, so that he ran through the intervening tones between the imperative accent and the angry accent. Athos! Porthos! Aramis! The two musketeers with whom we have already made acquaintance, and who answered to the last of these three names, immediately quitted the group of which they had formed a part, and advanced toward the cabinet, the door of which closed after them as soon as they had entered. Their appearance, though it was not quite at ease, excited by its carelessness, at once full of dignity and submission, the admiration of D'Artagnan, who beheld in these two men demigods, and in their leader an Olympian Jupiter, armed with all his thunders. When the two musketeers had entered, when the door was closed behind them, when the buzzing murmur of the antechamber, to which the summons which had been made had doubtless furnished fresh food, had recommenced, when M. de Treville had three or four times paced in silence and with a frowning brow the whole length of his cabinet, passing each time before Porthos and Aramis, who were as upright and silent as if on parade, he stopped all at once, full in front of them, and covering them from head to foot with an angry look. "'Do you know what the king said to me?' cried he. "'And that no longer ago than yesterday evening? Do you know, gentlemen?' "'No,' replied the two musketeers, after a moment's silence. "'No, sir, we do not.' "'But I hope that you will do us the honour to tell us.' added Aramis, in his politest tone, and with his most graceful bow. "'He told me that he should henceforth recruit his musketeers from among the guards of Monsieur the Cardinal.' "'The guards of the Cardinal? And why so?' asked Porthos warmly. "'Because he plainly perceives that his piquette stands in need of being enlivened by a mixture of good wine.' Footnote. A piquette, by the way, is a watered liquor made from the second pressing of the grape. End footnote. The two musketeers reddened to the whites of their eyes. D'Artagnan did not know where he was, and wished himself a hundred feet underground. Yes, yes, continued Monsieur de Treville, growing warmer as he spoke. And his majesty was right, for, upon my honour, it is true that the musketeers make but a miserable figure at court. The cardinal related yesterday, while playing with the king, with an air of condolence very displeasing to me, that the day before yesterday those damned musketeers, those daredevils, 
he dwelt upon those words with an ironical tone still more displeasing to me those braggarts added he glancing at me with his tiger cat's eye had made a riot in the rue Farou in a cabaret and that a party of his guards i thought he was going to laugh in my face had been forced to arrest the rioters morbleu you must know something about it arrest musketeers you were among them you were don't deny it you were recognized and the cardinal named you but it's all my fault yes it's all my fault because it is myself who selects my men you aramis why the devil did you ask me for a uniform when you would have been so much better in a cassock and you porthos do you only wear such a fine golden baldric to suspend a sword of straw from it and athos i don't see athos where is he ill very ill say you and of what malady it is feared that it may be the smallpox sir replied porthos desirous of taking his turn in the conversation and what is serious is that it will certainly spoil his face the smallpox that's a great story to tell me porthos sick of the smallpox at his age no no but wounded without doubt killed perhaps ah if i knew Sir blood messieurs musketeers i will not have this haunting of bad places this quarrelling in the streets this sword-play at the crossways and above all i will not have occasion given for the cardinal's guards were brave quiet skilful men who never put themselves in a position to be arrested and who besides never allow themselves to be arrested to laugh at you i am sure of it they would prefer dying on the spot to being arrested or taking back a step to save yourselves to scamper away to flee that is good for the king's musketeers porthos and aramis trembled with rage they could willingly have strangled monsieur de treville if at the bottom of all this they had not felt it was the great love he bore them which made him speak thus they stamped upon the carpet with their feet they bit their lips till the blood came and grasped the hilts of their swords with all their might all without had heard as we have said athos porthos and aramis called and had guessed from m de treville's tone of voice that he was very angry about something ten curious heads were glued to the tapestry and became pale with fury for their ears closely applied to the door did not lose a syllable of what he said while their mouths repeated as he went on the insulting expressions of the captain to all the people in the antechamber in an instant from the door of the cabinet to the street gate the whole hotel was boiling ah the king's musketeers are arrested by the guards of the cardinal are they continued m de treville as furious at heart as his soldiers but emphasizing his words and plunging them one by one so to say like so many blows of a stiletto into the bosoms of his auditors what six of his eminence's guards arrest six of his majesty's musketeers Morbleu! my part is taken i will go straight to the louvre i will give in my resignation as captain of the king's musketeers to take a lieutenancy in the cardinal's guards and if he refuses me morbleu i will turn abbe at these words the murmur without became an explosion nothing was to be heard but oaths and blasphemies the morbleus the sang dieus the mortu le diable crossed one another in the air d'artagnan looked for some tapestry behind which he might hide himself and felt an immense inclination to crawl under the table well my captain said porthos quite beside himself the truth is that we were six against six but we were not captured by fair means and before we had time to draw our swords two of our party were dead 
and Athos, grievously wounded, was very little better. For you know Athos. Well, Captain, he endeavoured twice to get up, and fell again twice. And we did not surrender. No, they dragged us away by force. On the way, we escaped. As for Athos, they believed him to be dead, and left him very quiet on the field of battle, not thinking it worth the trouble to carry him away. That's the whole story. What the devil, Captain? One cannot win all one's battles. The great Pompey lost that of Pharsalia, and Francis I, who was, as I have heard say, as good as other folks, nevertheless lost the Battle of Pavia. And I have the honour of assuring you that I killed one of them with his own sword, said Aramis, for mine was broken at the first parry killed him or poniarded him sir as is most agreeable to you i did not know that replied monsieur de treville in a somewhat softened tone the cardinal exaggerated as i perceive but pray sir continued aramis who seeing his captain become appeased ventured to risk a prayer do not say that athos is wounded he would be in despair if that should come to the ears of the king. And as the wound is very serious, seeing that after crossing the shoulder it penetrates into the chest, it is to be feared. At this instant the tapestry was raised and a noble and handsome head, but frightfully pale, appeared under the fringe. "'Athos!' cried the two musketeers. "'Athos!' repeated Monsieur de Treville himself. "'You have sent for me, sir,' said Athos to Monsieur de Treville, in a feeble yet perfectly calm voice. "'You have sent for me, as my comrades inform me, and I have hastened to receive your orders. I am here. What do you want with me?' And at these words the musketeer, in irreproachable costume, belted as usual, with a tolerably firm step, entered the cabinet. M. de Treville, moved to the bottom of his heart by this proof of courage, sprang toward him. "'I was about to say to these gentlemen,' added he, "'that I forbid my musketeers to expose their lives needlessly, for brave men are very dear to the king, and the king knows that his musketeers are the bravest on the earth. Your hand, Athos!' And without waiting for the answer of the newcomer to this proof of affection, M. de Treville seized his right hand and pressed it with all his might, without perceiving that Athos, whatever might be his self-command, allowed a slight murmur of pain to escape him, and if possible grew paler than he was before. The door had remained open, so strong was the excitement produced by the arrival of Athos, whose wound, though kept as a secret, was known to all. A burst of satisfaction hailed the last words of the captain, and two or three heads, carried away by the enthusiasm of the moment, appeared through the openings of the tapestry. M. de Treville was about to reprehend this breach of the rules of etiquette, when he felt the hand of Athos, who had rallied all his energies to contend against pain, at length, overcome by it, fell upon the floor as if he were dead. "'A surgeon!' cried M. de Treville. "'Mine! The king's! The best! A surgeon! Or, by king's blood, my brave Athos will die!' At the cries of M. de Treville, the whole assemblage rushed into the cabinet, he not thinking to shut the door against any one, and all crowded round the wounded man. But all this eager attention might have been useless if the doctor so loudly called for had not chanced to be in the hotel. He pushed through the crowd, approached Athos, still insensible, and as all this noise and commotion inconvenienced him greatly, he required, as the first and most urgent thing, that the musketeer should be carried into an adjoining chamber. Immediately, M. de Treville opened and pointed the way to Porthos and Aramis, who bore their comrade in their arms. Behind this group walked the surgeon, and behind the surgeon the door closed. The cabinet of M. de Treville, generally held so sacred, became in an instant the annex of the antechamber. Everyone spoke, 
harangued and vociferated, swearing, cursing, and consigning the cardinal and his guards to all the devils. An instant after, Porthos and Aramis re-entered, the surgeon and Monsieur de Treville alone remaining with the wounded. At length, Monsieur de Treville himself returned. The injured man had recovered his senses. The surgeon declared that the situation of the musketeer had nothing in it to render his friends uneasy, his weakness having been purely and simply caused by loss of blood. Then M. de Treville made a sign with his hand, and all retired except D'Artagnan, who did not forget that he had an audience, and with the tenacity of a Gascon remained in his place. When all had gone out, and the door was closed, M. de Treville, on turning round, found himself alone with the young man. The event which had occurred had in some degree broken the thread of his ideas. He inquired what was the will of his persevering visitor. D'Artagnan then repeated his name, and, in an instant recovering all his remembrances of the present and the past, M. de Treville grasped the situation. "'Pardon me,' said he, smiling. "'Pardon me, my dear compatriot, but I had wholly forgotten you. But what help is there for it? A captain is nothing but a father of a family, charged with even a greater responsibility than the father of an ordinary family. Soldiers are big children, but as I maintain that the orders of the king, and more particularly the orders of the cardinal, should be executed—' D'Artagnan could not restrain a smile. By this smile, Monsieur de Treville judged that he had not to deal with a fool, and changing the conversation, came straight to the point. "'I respected your father very much,' said he. "'What can I do for the son? Tell me quickly, my time is not my own.' "'Monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, "'on quitting Tarbes and coming hither, it was my intention to request of you, in remembrance of the fellowship which you have not forgotten, the uniform of a musketeer. But after all that I have seen during the last two hours, I comprehend that such a favour is enormous, and tremble lest I should not merit it. "'It is indeed a favour, young man,' replied M. de Treville. "'But it may not be so far beyond your hopes as you believe, or rather as you appear to believe.' but his majesty's decision is always necessary, and I inform you with regret that no one becomes a musketeer without the preliminary ordeal of several campaigns, certain brilliant actions, or a service of two years in some other regiment less favoured than ours. D'Artagnan bowed without replying, feeling his desire to don the musketeer's uniform vastly increased, by the great difficulties which preceded the attainment of it. "'But,' continued M. de Treville, fixing upon his compatriot a look so piercing that it might be said he wished to read the thoughts of his heart, "'on account of my old companion, your father, as I have said, I will do something for you, young man. Our recruits from Bern are not generally very rich.' and I have no reason to think matters have much changed in this respect since I left the province. I dare say you have not brought too large a stock of money with you?" D'Artagnan drew himself up with a proud air which plainly said, I ask alms of no man. "'Oh, that's very well, young man,' continued M. de Treville. "'That's all very well. I know these airs. I myself came to Paris with four crowns in my purse and would have fought with any one who dared to tell me that I was not in a condition to purchase the Louvre. D'Artagnan's bearing became still more imposing. Thanks to the sale of his horse, he commenced his career with four more crowns than M. de Treville possessed at the commencement of his. You ought, I say, then, to husband the means you have, however large the sum may be, but you ought also to endeavour to perfect yourself in the exercises becoming a gentleman. I will write a letter to-day to the director of the Royal Academy, and to-morrow he will admit you without any expense to yourself. Do not refuse this little service. Our best-born and richest gentlemen sometimes solicit it without being able to obtain it. You will learn horsemanship, 
swordsmanship in all its branches, and dancing. You will make some desirable acquaintances, and from time to time you can call upon me just to tell me how you are getting on, and to say whether I can be of further service to you. D'Artagnan, stranger as he was to all the manners of a court, could not but perceive a little coldness in this reception. "'Alas, sir,' said he, "'I cannot but perceive how sadly I miss the letter of introduction which my father gave me to present to you.' "'I certainly am surprised,' replied M. de Treville, "'that you should undertake so long a journey without that necessary passport, the sole resource of us poor baronets.' "'I had one, sir, and, thank God, such as I could wish,' cried D'Artagnan but it was perfidiously stolen from me. He then related the adventure of Mion, describing the unknown gentleman with all the greatest minuteness, and all with a warmth and truthfulness that delighted Monsieur de Treville. "'This is all very strange,' said Monsieur de Treville, after meditating a minute. "'You mentioned my name, then, aloud?' "'Yes, sir. I certainly committed that imprudence.' but why should I have done otherwise? A name like yours must be as a buckler to me on my way. Judge if I should not put myself under its protection. Flattery was at that period very current, and M. de Treville loved incense as well as a king, or even a cardinal. He could not refrain from a smile of visible satisfaction. But this smile soon disappeared, and, returning to the adventure of Meung, "'Tell me,' continued he, had not this gentleman a slight scar on his cheek? Yes, such a one as would be made by the grazing of a ball. Was he not a fine-looking man? Yes. Of lofty stature? Yes. Of pale complexion and brown hair? Yes, yes, that is he. How is it, sir, that you are acquainted with this man? If I ever find him again, and I will find him, I swear, were it in hell— he was waiting for a woman, continued Treville. He departed immediately after having conversed for a minute with her whom he awaited. You know not the subject of their conversation? He gave her a box, told her not to open it except in London. Was this woman English? He called her Milady. It is he, it must be he, murmured Treville. I believed him still at Brussels. "'Oh, sir, if you know who this man is,' cried D'Artagnan, "'tell me who he is, and whence he is. I will then release you from all your promises, even that of procuring my admission into the musketeers, for before everything I wish to avenge myself.' "'Beware, young man,' cried Treville. "'If you see him coming on one side of the street, pass by on the other. Do not cast yourself against such a rock.' He would break you like glass. That will not prevent me, replied D'Artagnan, if ever I find him. In the meantime, said Treville, seek him not, if I have a right to advise you. All at once the captain stopped, as if struck by a sudden suspicion. This great hatred which the young traveller manifested so loudly for this man, who, a rather improbable thing, had stolen his father's letter from him. Was there not some perfidy concealed under this hatred? Might not this young man be sent by his eminence? Might he not have come for the purpose of laying a snare for him? This pretended d'Artagnan. Was he not an emissary of the cardinal, whom the cardinal sought to introduce into Treville's house, to place near him, to win his confidence, and afterward to ruin him, as had been done in a thousand other instances? He fixed his eyes upon D'Artagnan even more earnestly than before. He was moderately reassured, however, by the aspect of that countenance, full of astute intelligence and affected humility. "'I know he is a Gascon,' reflected he, "'but he may be one for the cardinal as well as for me.' Let us try him. My friend, said he, slowly, I wish, as the son of an ancient friend, for I consider this story of the lost letter perfectly true, 
I wish, I say, in order to repair the coldness you may have remarked in my reception of you, to discover to you the secrets of our policy. The king and the cardinal are the best of friends. Their apparent bickerings are only feints to deceive fools. I am not willing that a compatriot, a handsome cavalier, a brave youth, quite fit to make his way, should become the dupe of all these artifices, and fall into the snare after the example of so many others who have been ruined by it. Be assured that I am devoted to both these all-powerful masters, and that my earnest endeavours have no other aim than the service of the king and also the cardinal, one of the most illustrious geniuses that France has ever produced. Now, young man, regulate your conduct accordingly, and if you entertain, whether from your family, your relations, or even from your instincts, any of these enmities which we see constantly breaking out against the cardinal, bid me adieu, and let us separate. I will aid you in many ways, but without attaching you to my person. I hope that my frankness at least will make you my friend." for you are the only young man to whom I have hitherto spoken as I have done to you. Treville said to himself, If the cardinal has set this young fox upon me, he will certainly not have failed, he who knows how bitterly I execrate him, to tell this spy that the best means of making his court to me is to rail at him. Therefore, in spite of all my protestations, if it be as I suspect— my cunning gossip will assure me that he holds his eminence in horror. It, however, proved otherwise. D'Artagnan answered with the greatest simplicity. I came to Paris with exactly such intentions. My father advised me to stoop to nobody but the king, the cardinal, and yourself, whom he considered the first three personages in France. D'Artagnan added Monsieur de Treville to the others, as may be perceived, but he thought this addition would do no harm. "'I have the greatest veneration for the cardinal,' continued he, "'and the most profound respect for his actions. So much the better for me, sir, if you speak to me, as you say, with frankness, for then you will do me the honour to esteem the resemblance of our opinions. But if you have entertained any doubt, as naturally you may, I feel that I am ruining myself by speaking the truth. But I still trust you will not esteem me the less for it, and that is my object before all others." Monsieur de Treville was surprised to the greatest degree. So much penetration, so much frankness, created admiration, and did not entirely remove his suspicions. The more this young man was superior to others, the more he was to be dreaded if he meant to deceive him. Nevertheless, he pressed D'Artagnan's hand and said to him, "'You are an honest youth, but at the present moment I can only do for you that which I have just now offered. My hotel will be always open to you. Hereafter, being able to ask for me at all hours, and consequently to take advantage of all opportunities, you will probably obtain that which you desire.' "'That is to say,' replied D'Artagnan, "'that you will wait until I have proved myself worthy of it. "'Well, be assured,' added he with the familiarity of a Gascon, "'you shall not wait long.' And he bowed in order to retire, and as if he considered the future in his own hands. "'But wait a minute,' said Monsieur de Treville, stopping him. "'I promised you a letter for the director of the Academy.' "'Are you too proud to accept it, young gentleman?' "'No, sir,' said D'Artagnan, "'and I will guard it so carefully that I will be sworn it shall arrive at its address, "'and woe be to him who shall attempt to take it from me.' Monsieur de Treville smiled at this flourish, and leaving his young man compatriot in the embrasure of the window, where they had talked together, he seated himself at a table in order to write the promised letter of recommendation. While he was doing this, D'Artagnan, having no better employment, amused himself with beating a march upon the window, and with looking at the musketeers, who went away one after another, 
following them with his eyes until they disappeared. Monsieur de Treville, after having written the letter, sealed it, and rising, approached the young man in order to give it to him. But at the very moment when D'Artagnan stretched out his hand to receive it, Monsieur de Treville was highly astonished to see his protégé make a sudden spring, become crimson with passion, and rush from the cabinet, blind, "'Splud! He shall not escape me this time!' "'And who?' asked Monsieur de Treville. "'He, my thief!' replied D'Artagnan. "'Oh, the traitor!' And he disappeared. "'The devil take the madman!' murmured Monsieur de Treville. "'Unless,' added he, "'this is a cunning mode of escaping, seeing that he had failed in his purpose.' End of chapter. Chapter four of the Three Musketeers, the Shoulder of Athos, the Baldric of Porthos, and the Handkerchief of Aramis. D'Artagnan, in a state of fury, crossed the antechamber at three bounds and was darting toward the stairs, which he reckoned upon descending four at a time, when, in his heedless course, he ran head foremost against a musketeer who was coming out of one of M. de Treville's private rooms, and, striking his shoulder violently, made him utter a cry, or rather, a howl. "'Excuse me,' said D'Artagnan, endeavouring to resume his course. "'Excuse me, but I am in a hurry.' Scarcely had he descended the first stair when a hand of iron seized him by the belt and stopped him. "'You are in a hurry,' said the musketeer, as pale as a sheet. Under that pretext you run against me? You say, excuse me, and you believe that is sufficient? Not at all, my young man. Do you fancy, because you have heard Monsieur de Treville speak to us a little cavalierly today, that other people are to treat us as he speaks to us? Undeceive yourself, comrade, you are not, Monsieur de Treville. My faith! replied D'Artagnan, recognizing Athos, who, after the dressing performed by the doctor, was returning to his own apartment. I did not do it intentionally, and not doing it intentionally, I said, excuse me. It appears to me this is quite enough. I repeat to you, however, and this time on my word of honour, I think perhaps too often, that I am in haste, great haste. Leave your hold, then, I beg of you, and let me go where my business calls me. Monsieur, said Athos, letting him go, you are not polite. It is easy to perceive that you come from a distance. D'Artagnan had already strode down three or four stairs, but at Athos's last remark he stopped short. More bleu, monsieur, said he. However far I may come, it is not you who can give me a lesson in good manners, I warn you. Perhaps, said Athos. Ah, if I were not in such haste, and if I were not running after someone, said D'Artagnan. Monsieur, man in a hurry, you can find me without running. Me, you understand. And where, I pray you? Near the Carme des Chaux. At what hour? About noon. About noon? That will do. I will be there. Endeavour not to make me wait, for at quarter past twelve I will cut off your ears as you run. Good, said D'Artagnan. I will be there ten minutes before twelve. And he set off running as if the devil possessed him, hoping that he might yet find the stranger, whose slow pace could not have carried him far. But at the street gate Porthos was talking with the soldier on guard. Between the two talkers there was just enough room for a man to pass. D'Artagnan thought it would suffice for him, and he sprang forward like a dart between them. But D'Artagnan had reckoned without the wind. As he was about to pass, the wind blew out Porthos's long cloak, and D'Artagnan rushed straight into the middle of it. Without doubt, Porthos had reasons for not abandoning this part of his vestments, for instead of quitting his hold on the flap in his hand, he pulled it toward him, so that D'Artagnan rolled himself up in the velvet by a movement of rotation explained by the persistency of Porthos. D'Artagnan, hearing the musketeer swear, wished to escape from the cloak which blinded him, and sought to find his way from under the folds of it. He was particularly anxious to avoid marring the freshness of the magnificent baldric we are acquainted with, but on timidly opening his eyes he found himself with his nose fixed between the two shoulders of Porthos, that is to say, exactly upon the baldric. 
Alas, like most things in this world which have nothing in their favour but appearances, the baldric was glittering with gold in the front, but nothing but simple buff behind. Vainglorious as he was, Porthos could not afford to have a baldric wholly of gold, but had at least half. One could comprehend the necessity of the cold and the urgency of the cloak. "'Bless me!' cried Porthos, making strong efforts to disembarrass himself of D'Artagnan, who was wriggling about his back. "'You must be mad to run against people in this manner!' "'Excuse me!' said D'Artagnan, reappearing under the shoulder of the giant. "'But I am in such haste! I was running after someone, and—' "'And do you always forget your eyes when you run?' asked Porthos. "'No,' replied D'Artagnan, piqued, "'and thanks to my eyes I see what other people cannot see.' Whether Porthos understood him or did not understand him, giving way to his anger, "'Monsieur,' said he, "'you stand a chance of getting chastised if you rub musketeers in this fashion.' "'Chastised, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan. "'The expression is strong.' It is one that becomes a man accustomed to look his enemies in the face. Ah, pardieu, I know full well that you don't turn your back to yours. And the young man, delighted with his joke, went away laughing loudly. Porthos foamed with rage, and made a movement to rush after D'Artagnan. Presently, presently, cried the latter, when you haven't your cloak on. At one o'clock, then, behind the Luxembourg. "'Very well. At one o'clock, then,' replied D'Artagnan, turning the angle of the street. But neither in the street he had passed through, nor in the one which his eager glance pervaded, could he see any one. However slowly the stranger had walked, he was gone on his way, or perhaps had entered some house. D'Artagnan inquired of every one he met with, went down to the ferry, came up again by the Rue de Seine, and the Red Cross, but nothing.' absolutely nothing. This chase was, however, advantageous to him in one sense, for in proportion as the perspiration broke from his forehead, his heart began to cool. He began to reflect upon the events that had passed. They were numerous and inauspicious. It was scarcely eleven o'clock in the morning, and yet this morning had already brought him into disgrace with Monsieur de Treville, who could not fail to think the manner in which D'Artagnan had left him a little cavalier. Besides this, he had drawn upon himself two good duels with two men, each capable of killing three D'Artagnans, with two musketeers, in short, with two of those beings who he esteemed so greatly that he placed them in his mind and heart above all other men. The outlook was sad. Sure of being killed by Athos, it may easily be understood that the young man was not very uneasy about Porthos. As hope, however, is the last thing extinguished in the heart of man, he finished by hoping that he might survive, even though with terrible wounds, in both these duels, and, in case of surviving, he made the following reprehensions upon his own conduct. "'What a madcap I was, and what a stupid fellow I am!' That brave and unfortunate Athos was wounded on that very shoulder against which I must run head foremost, like a ram. The only thing that astonishes me is that he did not strike me dead at once. He had good cause to do so. The pain I gave him must have been atrocious. As to Porthos, oh, as to Porthos, faith, that's a droll affair. And in spite of himself, the young man began to laugh aloud looking round carefully, however, to see that his solitary laugh, without a cause in the eyes of passers-by, offended no one. "'As to Porthos, that is certainly droll. But I am not the less a giddy fool. Are people to be run against without warning? No. And have I any right to go and peep under their cloaks to see what is not there? He would have pardoned me, he would certainly have pardoned me if I had not said anything to him about that cursed baldric. In ambiguous words, it is true, but rather drolly ambiguous. Ah, cursed Gascon that I am, I get from one hobble into another. Friend d'Artagnan, continued he, speaking to himself with all the amenity that he thought due himself, if you escape, 
of which there is not much chance. I would advise you to practice perfect politeness for the future. You must henceforth be admired and quoted as a model of it. To be obliging and polite does not necessarily make a man a coward. Look at Aramis now. Aramis is mildness and grace personified. Well, did anybody ever dream of calling Aramis a coward? No, certainly not, and from this moment I will endeavour to model myself after him. Ah, that's strange. Here he is. D'Artagnan, walking and soliloquizing, had arrived within a few steps of the Hotel d'Arguillon, and in front of that hotel perceived Aramis, chatting gaily with three gentlemen. But as he had not forgotten that it was in presence of this young man that M. de Treville had been so angry in the morning, and as a witness of the rebuke the musketeers had received was not likely to be at all agreeable, he pretended not to see him. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, quite full of his plans of conciliation and courtesy, approached the young men with a profound bow, accompanied by a most gracious smile. All four, besides, immediately broke off their conversation. D'Artagnan was not so dull as not to perceive that he was one too many, but he was not sufficiently broken into the fashions of the gay world to know how to extricate himself gallantly from a false position, like that of a man who begins to mingle with people he is scarcely acquainted with, and in a conversation that does not concern him. He was seeking in his mind, then, for the least awkward means of retreat, when he remarked that Aramis had let his handkerchief fall, and by mistake, no doubt, had placed his foot upon it. This appeared to be a favourable opportunity to repair his intrusion. He stooped, and with the most gracious air he could assume, drew the handkerchief from under the foot of the musketeer, in spite of the efforts the latter made to detain it, and holding it out to him said, "'I believe, monsieur, that this is a handkerchief you would be sorry to lose?' The handkerchief was indeed richly embroidered, and had a coronet and arms at one of its corners. Aramis blushed excessively, and snatched, rather than took, the handkerchief from the hand of the Gascon. "'Ho, ho, ho, ho!' cried one of the guards. "'Will you persist in saying, most discreet Aramis, that you are not on good terms with Madame de Bois-Tracy, when that gracious lady has the kindness to lend you one of her handkerchiefs?' Aramis darted at D'Artagnan one of those looks which inform a man that he has acquired a mortal enemy. Then, resuming his mild air, "'You are deceived, gentlemen,' said he. "'This handkerchief is not mine, and I cannot fancy why Monsieur has taken it into his head to offer it to me rather than to one of you, and as a proof of what I say, here is mine in my pocket.' So saying, he pulled out his own handkerchief, likewise a very elegant handkerchief, and a fine cambric, though cambric was dear at the period, but a handkerchief without embroidery and without arms, only ornamented with a single cipher, that of its proprietor. This time D'Artagnan was not hasty. He perceived his mistake, but the friends of Aramis were not at all convinced by his denial, and one of them addressed the young musketeer with affected seriousness. "'If it were as you pretend it is,' said he, "'I should be forced, my dear Aramis, to reclaim it myself. For, as you very well know, Bois-Tracy is an intimate friend of mine, and I cannot allow the property of his wife to be sported as a trophy.' "'You make the demand badly,' replied Aramis, "'and while acknowledging the justice of your reclamation, I refuse it on account of the form. "'The fact is,' hazarded D'Artagnan timidly, "'I did not see the handkerchief fall from the pocket of Monsieur Aramis. "'He had his foot upon it, that is all, "'and I thought from having his foot upon it the handkerchief was his.' "'And you were deceived, my dear sir,' replied Aramis coldly, "'very little sensible to the reparation.' Then, turning toward that one of the guards who had declared himself the friend of Bois-Tracy, "'Besides,' continued he, "'I have reflected, my dear intimate of Bois-Tracy, 
that I am not less tenderly his friend than you can possibly be, so that, decidedly, this handkerchief is as likely to have fallen from your pocket as mine. No, upon my honour, cried His Majesty's guardsman. You are about to swear upon your honour, and I upon my word, and then it will be pretty evident that one of us will have lied. Now here, Monteron, we will do better than that. Let each take a half. Of the handkerchief? Yes. Perfectly just, cried the other two guardsmen. The judgment of King Solomon. Aramis, you certainly are full of wisdom. The young men burst into a laugh, and as may be supposed, the affair had no other sequel. In a moment or two the conversation ceased, and the three guardsmen and the musketeer, after having cordially shaken hands, separated, the guardsmen going one way and Aramis another. "'Now is my time to make peace with this gallant man,' said D'Artagnan to himself, having stood on one side during the whole of the latter part of the conversation, and with this good feeling drawing near to Aramis, who was departing without paying any attention to him, Monsieur, said he, you will excuse me, I hope. Ah, monsieur, interrupted Aramis, permit me to observe to you that you have not acted in this affair as a gallant man ought. What, monsieur, cried D'Artagnan, and do you suppose? I suppose, monsieur, that you are not a fool, and that you knew very well, although coming from Gascony, that people do not tread upon handkerchiefs without a reason. What the devil! Paris is not paved with cambric. Monsieur, you act wrongly in endeavouring to mortify me, said D'Artagnan, in whom the natural quarrelsome spirit began to speak more loudly than his pacific resolutions. I am from Gascony, it is true, and since you know it, there is no occasion to tell you that Gascons are not very patient, so that when they have begged to be excused once, were it even for a folly, they are convinced that they have done already at least as much again as they ought to have done. Monsieur, what I say to you about the matter, said Aramis, is not for the sake of seeking a quarrel. Thank God I am not a bravo, and being a musketeer but for a time, I only fight when I am forced to do so, and always with great repugnance. But this time— the affair is serious, for here is a lady compromised by you. "'By us, you mean?' cried D'Artagnan. "'Why did you so maladroitly restore me the handkerchief? "'Why did you so awkwardly let it fall?' "'I have said, monsieur, and I repeat, that the handkerchief did not fall from my pocket. "'And thereby you have lied twice, monsieur, for I saw it fall.' "'Ah!' You take it with that tone, do you, Master Gascon? Well, I will teach you how to behave yourself. And I will send you back to your mass-book, Master Abbey. Draw, if you please, and instantly. Not so, if you please, my good friend. Not here, at least. Do you not perceive that we are opposite the Hotel d'Arguillon, which is full of the cardinal's creatures? How do I know that this is not his eminence who has honoured you with the commission to procure my head? Now, I entertained a ridiculous partiality for my head. It seems to suit my shoulders so correctly. I wish to kill you, be at rest as to that, but to kill you quietly, in a snug, remote place, where you will not be able to boast of your death to anybody. I agree, monsieur, but do not be too confident. Take your handkerchief, whether it belongs to you or another, you may perhaps stand in need of it. Monsieur is a Gascon? asked Aramis. Yes, monsieur does not postpone an interview through prudence. Prudence, monsieur, is a virtue sufficiently useless to musketeers, I know, but indispensable to churchmen, and as I am only a musketeer provisionally, I hold it good to be prudent. At two o'clock I shall have the honour of expecting you at the hotel of Monsieur de Treville. There I will indicate to you the best place and time. The two young men bowed and separated, Aramis ascending the street which led to the Luxembourg, while D'Artagnan, perceiving the appointed hour was approaching, took the road to the Carme des Chaux, saying to himself, 
decidedly I can't draw back, but at least, if I am killed, I shall be killed by a musketeer. End of chapter. Chapter 5 of The Three Musketeers The King's Musketeers and the Cardinal's Guards D'Artagnan was acquainted with nobody in Paris. He went, therefore, to his appointment with Athos without a second, determined to be satisfied with those his adversary should choose. Besides, his intention was formed to make the brave musketeer all suitable apologies, but without meanness or weakness, fearing that might result from this duel which generally results from an affair of this kind, when a young and vigorous man fights with an adversary who is wounded and weakened. If conquered, he doubles the triumph of his antagonist. If a conqueror, he is accused of foul play and want of courage. Now, we must have badly painted the character of our adventure-seeker, or our readers must have already perceived that D'Artagnan was not an ordinary man. Therefore, while repeating to himself that his death was inevitable, he did not make up his mind to die quietly, as one less courageous and less restrained might have done in his place. He reflected upon the different characters of those with whom he was going to fight, and began to view his situation more clearly. He hoped, by means of loyal excuses, to make a friend of Athos, whose lordly air and austere bearing pleased him much. He flattered himself he should be able to frighten Porthos with the adventure of the baldric, which he might, if not killed upon the spot, relate to everybody a recital which, well managed, would cover Porthos with ridicule. As to the astute Aramis, he did not entertain much dread of him and supposing he should be able to get that far, he determined to dispatch him in good style, or at least by hitting him in the face, as Caesar recommended his soldiers do to those of Pompey, to damage forever the beauty of which he was so proud. In addition to this, D'Artagnan possessed that invincible stock of resolution which the counsels of his father had implanted in his heart. Endure nothing from any one but the king, the cardinal, and Monsieur de Treville. He flew, then, rather than walked, toward the convent of the Carme des Chausses, or rather des Chaux, as it was called at that period, a sort of building without a window, surrounded by barren fields, an accessory to the pré aux and which was generally employed as the place for the duels of men who had no time to lose. When D'Artagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of ground which extended along the foot of the monastery, Athos had been waiting about five minutes, and twelve o'clock was striking. He was, then, as punctual as the Samaritan woman, and the most rigorous casuist with regard to duels could have nothing to say. Athos, who still suffered grievously from his wound, though it had been dressed anew by M. de Treville's surgeon, was seated on a post and waiting for his adversary with hat in hand, his feather even touching the ground. Monsieur said Athos. I have engaged two of my friends as seconds, but these two friends are not yet come, at which I am astonished, as it is not at all their custom. I have no seconds on my part, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, for having only arrived yesterday in Paris, I as yet know no one but Monsieur de Treville, to whom I was recommended by my father, who has the honour to be, in some degree, one of his friends." Athos reflected for an instant. "'You know no one but Monsieur de Treville?' he asked. "'Yes, monsieur, I know only him.' "'Well, but then,' continued Athos, speaking half to himself, "'if I kill you I shall have the air of a boy-slayer.' "'Not too much so,' replied D'Artagnan, with a bow that was not deficient in dignity. Since you do me the honour to draw a sword with me while suffering from a wound which is very inconvenient. Very inconvenient, upon my word, and you hurt me devilishly, I can tell you. But I will take the left hand, it is my custom in such circumstances. Do not fancy that I do you a favour, I use either hand easily, and it will be even a disadvantage to you. A left-handed man is very troublesome to people who are not prepared for it. I regret I did not inform you sooner of this circumstance. "'You have truly, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, bowing again, "'a courtesy, for which I assure you I am very grateful.' 
"'You confuse me,' replied Athos, with his gentlemanly air. "'Let us talk of something else, if you please. Ah, Splud, how you have hurt me! My shoulder quite burns.' "'If you would permit me,' said D'Artagnan, with timidity. "'What, monsieur?' "'I have a miraculous balsam for wounds, a balsam given to me by my mother, and of which I have made a trial upon myself.' "'Well?' "'Well, I am sure that in less than three days this balsam would cure you, and at the end of three days, when you would be cured, well, sir, it would still do me a great honour to be your man.' D'Artagnan spoke these words with a simplicity that did honour to his courtesy, without throwing the least doubt upon his courage. "'Pardieu, monsieur,' said Athos, "'that's a proposition that pleases me, not that I can accept it, but a league off its savours of the gentleman. Thus spoke and acted the gallant knights of the time of Charlemagne, in whom every cavalier ought to seek his model. Unfortunately, we do not live in the times of the great emperor. We live in the times of the cardinal, and three days hence, however well the secret might be guarded, it would be known, I say, that we were to fight, and our combat would be prevented. I think these fellows will never come." "'If you are in haste, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, with the same simplicity with which a moment before he had proposed to him to put off the duel for three days, "'and if it be your will to dispatch me at once, do not inconvenience yourself, I pray you.' "'Here is another word which pleases me,' cried Athos, with a gracious nod to D'Artagnan. "'That did not come from a man without a heart, monsieur. I love men of your kidney.' and I foresee plainly that if we don't kill each other, I shall hereafter have much pleasure in your conversation. We will wait for these gentlemen, so please you. I have plenty of time, and it will be more correct. Ah, here is one of them, I believe. In fact, at the end of the Rue Vaugirard, the gigantic Porthos appeared. What? cried D'Artagnan. Is your first witness Monsieur Porthos? Yes, that disturbs you by no means and here is the second d'artagnan turned in the direction pointed to by athos and perceived aramis what cried he in an accent of greater astonishment than before your second witness is monsieur aramis doubtless are you not aware that we are never seen one without the others and that we are called among the musketeers and the guards at court and in the city Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or the three inseparables? And yet, as you come from Dax, or Pau, or—' "'From Tarbes,' said D'Artagnan. "'It is probable you are ignorant of this little fact,' said Athos. "'My faith,' replied D'Artagnan, "'you are well named, gentlemen, and my adventure, if it should make any noise, will prove at least that your union is not founded upon contrasts.' In the meantime, Porthos had come up, waved his hand to Athos, and then, turning toward D'Artagnan, stood quite astonished. Let us say, in passing, that he had changed his baldric and relinquished his cloak. "'Ah! Ah!' said he. "'What does this mean?' "'This is the gentleman I am going to fight with,' said Athos, pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand and saluting him with the same gesture. "'Why, it is with him I am also going to fight,' said Porthos. "'But not before one o'clock,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And I am also to fight with this gentleman,' said Aramis, coming in his turn unto the place. "'But not until two o'clock,' said D'Artagnan, with the same calmness. "'But what are you going to fight about, Athos?' asked Aramis. "'Faith, I don't very well know.' He hurt my shoulder. And you, Porthos? <laughs> Faith, I am going to fight. Uh, because I am going to fight, answered Porthos, reddening. Athos, whose keen eye lost nothing, perceived a faintly sly smile pass over the lips of the young Gascon as he replied, We had a short discussion upon dress. And you, Aramis? asked Athos. "'Oh, ours is a theological quarrel,' replied Aramis, making a sign to D'Artagnan to keep secret the cause of their duel. 
Athos indeed saw a second smile on the lips of D'Artagnan. Indeed, said Athos. Yes, a passage of St. Augustine upon which we could not agree, said the Gascon. Decidedly, this is a clever fellow, murmured Athos. And now you are assembled, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan. Permit me to offer you my apologies. At this word, apologies, a cloud passed over the brow of Athos, a haughty smile curled the lips of Porthos, and a negative sign was the reply of Aramis. "'You do not understand me, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, throwing up his head, the sharp and bold lines of which were at the moment gilded by a bright ray of the sun. "'I ask to be excused in case I should not be able to discharge my debt to all three, for Monsieur Athos has the right to kill me first, which must much diminish the face value of your bill, Monsieur Porthos, and render yours almost null, Monsieur Aramis. And now, gentlemen, I repeat, excuse me, but on that account only, and on guard. At these words, with the most gallant air possible, D'Artagnan drew his sword. The blood had mounted to the head of D'Artagnan, and at that moment he would have drawn his sword against all the musketeers in the kingdom as willingly as he now did against Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It was a quarter past midday. The sun was in its zenith, and the spot chosen for the scene of the duel was exposed to its full ardour. "'It is very hot,' said Athos, drawing his sword in its turn. "'And yet I cannot take off my doublet, for I just now felt my wound beginning to bleed again, and I should not like to annoy Monsieur with a sight of blood which he has not drawn from me himself.' "'That is true, Monsieur.' said d'artagnan and whether drawn by myself or another i assure you i shall always view with regret the blood of so brave a gentleman i will therefore fight in my doublet like yourself come come enough of such compliments cried porthos remember we are waiting for our turns speak for yourself when you are inclined to utter such incongruities interrupted aramis for my part I think what they say is very well said, and quite worthy of two gentlemen. "'When you please, monsieur,' said Athos, putting himself on guard. "'I waited your orders,' said D'Artagnan, crossing swords. But scarcely had the two rapiers clashed, when a company of the guards of his eminence, commanded by Monsieur de Jossac, turned the corner of the convent. "'The cardinal's guards!' cried Aramis and Porthos at the same time. "'Sheathe your swords, gentlemen, sheathe your swords!' But it was too late. The two combatants had been seen in a position which left no doubt of their intentions. "'Halloo!' cried Jussac, advancing toward them and making a sign to his men to do so likewise. "'Halloo, musketeers! Fighting here, are you? And the edicts? What has become of them?' "'You are very generous, gentlemen of the guards,' said Athos, full of rancour, for Jussac was one of the aggressors of the preceding day. "'If we were to see you fighting, I can assure you that we would make no effort to prevent you. Leave us alone, then, and you will enjoy a little amusement without cost to yourselves.' "'Gentlemen,' said Jussac, "'it is with great regret that I pronounce the thing impossible.' duty before everything sheathe then if you please and follow us monsieur said aramis parodying jussac it would afford us great pleasure to obey your polite invitation if it depended upon ourselves but uh, unfortunately the thing is impossible monsieur de treville has forbidden it pass on your way then it is the best thing to do this raillery exasperated Jussac. "'We will charge upon you, then,' said he, "'if you disobey.' "'There are five of them,' said Athos, half aloud, "'and we are but three. We shall be beaten again, and must die on the spot. For on my part I declare I will never appear again before the captain as a conquered man.' Athos, Porthos, and Aramis instantly drew near one another, while Jussac drew up his soldiers. This short interval was sufficient to determine D'Artagnan on the part he was to take. 
It was one of those events which decide the life of a man. It was a choice between the king and the cardinal. The choice made, it must be persisted in. To fight, that was to disobey the law. That was to risk his head. That was to make at one blow an enemy of a minister more powerful than the king himself. All this the young man perceived, and yet, to his praise we speak it, he did not hesitate a second. Turning towards Athos and his friends, "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'allow me to correct your words, if you please. You said you were but three, but it appears to me we are four. "'But you are not one of us.' said Porthos. "'That's true,' replied D'Artagnan. "'I have not the uniform, but I have the spirit. My heart is that of a musketeer. I feel it, monsieur, and that impels me on.' "'Withdraw, young man,' cried Jussac, who doubtless, by his gestures and the expression of his countenance, had guessed D'Artagnan's design. "'You may retire. We consent to that. Save your skin. Be gone quickly.' D'Artagnan did not budge. "'Decidedly, you are a brave fellow,' said Athos, pressing the young man's hand. "'Come, come, choose your part,' replied Jussac. "'Well,' said Porthos to Aramis, "'we must do something.' "'Monsieur is full of generosity,' said Athos. But all three reflected upon the youth of D'Artagnan, and dreaded his inexperience." We should only be three, one of whom is wounded, with the addition of a boy, resumed Athos, and yet it will not be the less said that we were four men. Yes, but to yield, said Porthos. That is difficult, replied Athos. D'Artagnan comprehended their irresolution. Try me, gentlemen, said he, and I swear to you by my honor that I will not go hence if we are conquered. "'What is your name, my brave fellow?' said Athos. "'D'Artagnan, monsieur.' "'Well, then, Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, forward!' cried Athos. "'Come, gentlemen, have you decided?' cried Jussac for the third time. "'It is done, gentlemen,' said Athos. "'And what is your choice?' asked Jussac. "'We are about to have the honour of charging you.' replied Aramis, lifting his hat with one hand and drawing his sword with the other. "'Ah! <laughs> you resist, do you?' cried Jussac. "'God's blood! Does that astonish you?' And the nine combatants rushed upon each other with a fury which, however, did not exclude a certain degree of method. Athos fixed upon a certain Cahusac, a favourite of the cardinals. Porthos had Bicarat and Aramis found himself opposed to two adversaries. As to D'Artagnan, he sprang toward Jussac himself. The heart of the young Gascon beat as if it would burst through his side. Not from fear, God be thanked, he had not the shade of it, but with emulation he fought like a furious tiger, turning ten times round his adversary, and changing his ground and his guard twenty times. Jussac was, as was then said, a fine blade, and had had much practice. Nevertheless, it required all his skill to defend himself against an adversary who, active and energetic, departed every instant from received rules, attacking him on all sides at once, and yet parrying like a man who had the greatest respect for his own epidermis. This contest at length exhausted Jussac's patience. Furious at being held in check by one whom he had considered a boy, he became warm and began to make mistakes. D'Artagnan, who, though wanting in practice, had a sound theory, redoubled his agility. Jussac, anxious to put an end to this, springing forward, aimed a terrible thrust at his adversary, but the latter parried it, and while Jussac was recovering himself, glided like a serpent beneath his blade and passed his sword through his body. Jussac fell like a dead mass. D'Artagnan then cast an anxious and rapid glance over the field of battle. Aramis had killed one of his adversaries, but the other pressed him warmly. Nevertheless, Aramis was in a good situation, and able to defend himself. Bicarat and Porthos had just made counter-hits. Porthos had received a thrust through his arm, and Bicarat one through his thigh. 
but neither of these two wounds was serious, and they only fought more earnestly. Athos, wounded anew by Cahusac, became evidently paler, but did not give way a foot. He only changed his sword hand and fought with his left hand. According to the laws of dueling at that period, D'Artagnan was at liberty to assist whom he pleased. While he was endeavouring to find out which of his companions stood in greatest need, he caught a glance from Athos. The glance was of sublime eloquence. Athos would have died rather than appeal for help, but he could look, and with that look ask assistance. D'Artagnan interpreted it. With a terrible bound he sprang to the side of Cahusac, crying, "'To me, Monsieur Guardsman, I will slay you!' Cahusac turned. It was time, for Athos, whose great courage alone supported him, sank upon his knee. "'God's blood!' cried he to D'Artagnan. "'Do not kill him, young man, I beg of you. I have an old affair to settle with him when I am cured and sound again. Disarm him only, make sure of his sword, that's it, very well done!' The exclamation was drawn from Athos by seeing the sword of Cahusac fly twenty paces from him. D'Artagnan and Cahusac sprang forward at the same instant, the one to recover, the other to obtain the sword. But D'Artagnan, being the more active, reached it first and placed his foot upon it. Cahusac immediately ran to the guardsman whom Aramis had killed, seized his rapier, and returned toward D'Artagnan. But on his way he met Athos, who during his relief which D'Artagnan had procured him had recovered his breath and who, for fear that D'Artagnan would kill his enemy, wished to resume the fight. D'Artagnan perceived that it would be disobliging Athos not to leave him alone, and in a few minutes Cahusac fell, with a sword thrust through his throat. At the same instant Aramis placed his sword-point on the breast of his fallen enemy, and forced him to ask for mercy. There only then remained Porthos and Bicarat. Porthos made a thousand flourishes, asking Bicarat what o'clock it could be, and offering him his compliments upon his brother's having just obtained a company in the regiment of Navarre. But, just as he might, he gained nothing. Bicarat was one of those iron men who never fell dead. Nevertheless, it was necessary to finish. The watch might come up and take all the combatants, wounded or not, royalists or cardinalists. Athos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan surrounded Bicarat, and required him to surrender. Though alone against all and with a wound in his thigh, Bicarat wished to hold out, but Jussac, who had risen upon his elbow, cried out to him to yield. Bicarat was a Gascon, as D'Artagnan was. He turned a deaf ear, and contented himself with laughing, and between two parries finding time to point to a spot of earth with his sword. Here! cried he parodying a verse of the Bible, Here will Bicarat die, for I only am left, and they seek my life. But there are four against you. Leave off, I command you. Ah, if you command me, that's another thing, said Bicarat. As you are my commander, it is my duty to obey. And springing backward, he broke his sword across his knee to avoid the necessity of surrendering it, threw the pieces over the convent wall, and crossed his arms, whistling a cardinalist air. Bravery is always respected, even in an enemy. The musketeers saluted Bicarat with their swords, and returned them to their sheaths. D'Artagnan did the same. Then, assisted by Bicarat, the only one left standing, they bore Jussac, Cahusac, and one of Aramis's adversaries who was only wounded, under the porch of the convent. The fourth, as we have said, was dead. They then rang the bell, and carrying away four swords out of five, they took their road, intoxicated with joy, toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville. They walked arm in arm, occupying the whole width of the street, and taking in every musketeer they met, so that in the end it became a triumphal march. The heart of D'Artagnan swam in delirium. He marched between Athos and Porthos, pressing them tenderly. "'If I am not yet a musketeer,' said he to his new friends, as he passed through the gateway of M. de Treville's hotel, "'at least I have entered upon my apprenticeship, haven't I?' End of chapter 
Chapter Six of The Three Musketeers, His Majesty King Louis the Thirteenth. This affair made a great noise. Monsieur de Treville scolded his musketeers in public and congratulated them in private. But as no time was to be lost in gaining the king, Monsieur de Treville hastened to report himself at the Louvre. It was already too late. The king was closeted with the cardinal and M. de Treville was informed that the king was busy and could not receive him at that moment. In the evening M. de Treville attended the king's gaming-table. The king was winning, and as he was very avaricious, he was in an excellent humour. Perceiving M. de Treville at a distance, "'Come here, M. Capitaine,' said he. "'Come here, that I may growl at you.' Do you know that his eminence has been making fresh complaints against your musketeers, and that with so much emotion that this evening his eminence is indisposed? Ah, these musketeers of yours are very devils, fellows to be hanged. No, sire, replied Treville, who saw at the first glance how things would go. On the contrary, they are good creatures, as meek as lambs, and have but one desire, I'll be their warranty, that is, that their swords may never leave their scabbards but in your majesty's service. But what are they to do? The guards of Monsieur the Cardinal are for ever seeking quarrels with them, and for the honour of the corps even, the poor young men are obliged to defend themselves. "'Listen to Monsieur de Treville,' said the king, listen to him <laughs> would not one say he was speaking of a religious community in truth my dear captain i have a great mind to take away your commission and give it to mademoiselle de chemerault to whom i promised an abbey <laughs> but don't fancy that i am going to take you on your bare word i am called louis the just monsieur de treville and by and by by and by we will see ah sire it is because i confide in that justice that i shall wait patiently and quietly the good pleasure of your majesty well then monsieur wait said the king i will not detain you long in fact fortune changed and as the king began to lose what he had won he was not sorry to find an excuse for playing charlemagne if we may use a gaming phrase of whose origin we confess our ignorance. The king, therefore, arose a minute after, and putting the money which lay before him into his pocket, the major part of which arose from his winnings, La Vieuxville, said he, take my place. I must speak to Monsieur de Treville on an affair of importance. Ah, I had eighty louis before me. Put down the same sum so that they who have lost may have nothing to complain of. Justice before everything. Then, turning toward Monsieur de Treville, and walking with him toward the embrasure of a window, "'Well, Monsieur,' continued he, "'you say it is his eminence's guards who have sought a quarrel with your musketeers?' "'Yes, sire, as they always do.' "'And how did the thing happen?' let us see for you know my dear captain a judge must hear both sides good lord in the most simple and natural manner possible three of my best soldiers whom your majesty knows by name and whose devotedness you have more than once appreciated and who have i dare affirm to the king his service much at heart three of my best soldiers i say athos porthos and aramis had made a party of pleasure with a young fellow from Gascony, whom I had introduced to them the same morning. The party was to take place at Saint-Germain, I believe, and they had appointed to meet at the Carme des Chaux, where they were disturbed by de Jussac, Cahusac, Bicarat, and two other guardsmen, who certainly did not go there in such a numerous company without some ill intention against the edicts. Ah! Ah! "'You incline me to think so,' said the king. "'There is no doubt they went thither to fight themselves.' "'I do not accuse them, sire, 
but I leave your majesty to judge what five armed men could possibly be going to do in such a deserted place as the neighbourhood of the convent des Carmes. Yes, you are right, Treville, you are right. Then, upon seeing my musketeers, they changed their minds, and forgot their private hatred for partisan hatred, for your majesty cannot be ignorant that the musketeers, who belong to the king and nobody but the king, are the natural enemies of the guardsmen, who belong to the cardinal. Yes, Treville, yes, said the king in a melancholy tone. And it is very sad, believe me, to see thus two parties in France, two heads to royalty. But all this will come to an end, Treville, will come to an end. You say, then, that the guardsmen sought a quarrel with the musketeers. I say that it is probable that things have fallen out so, but I will not swear to it, sire. You know how difficult it is to discover the truth and unless a man be endowed with that admirable instinct which causes Louis the Thirteenth to be named the just. You are right, Treville, but they were not alone, your musketeers. They had a youth with them. Yes, sire, and one wounded man, so that three of the king's musketeers, one of whom was wounded, and a youth not only maintained their ground against five of the most terrible of the cardinal's guardsmen, but absolutely brought four of them to earth. "'Why, why, this is a victory!' cried the king, all radiant. "'A complete victory!' "'Yes, sire, as complete as that of the Bridge of Say. Four men, one of them wounded, and a youth, say you. One hardly a young man, but who, however, behaved himself so admirably on this occasion— that I will take the liberty of recommending him to your majesty. How does he call himself? D'Artagnan, sire. He is the son of one of my oldest friends, the son of a man who served under the king your father, of glorious memory, in the Civil War. And you say this young man behaved himself well? Tell me how, Treville. You know how I delight in accounts of war and fighting." and Louis the Thirteenth twisted his moustache proudly, placing his hand upon his hip. "'Sire,' resumed Treville, "'as I told you, Monsieur d'Artagnan is little more than a boy, and as he has not the honour of being a musketeer, he was dressed as a citizen. The guards of the cardinal, perceiving his youth and that he did not belong to the corps, invited him to retire before they attacked.' "'So you may plainly see, Treville,' interrupted the king. "'It was they who attacked?' "'That is true, sire. There can be no more doubt on that head. They called upon him then to retire, but he answered that he was a musketeer at heart, entirely devoted to your majesty, and that, therefore, he would remain with messieurs the musketeers.' "'Brave young man,' murmured the king." Well, he did remain with them, and your majesty has in him so firm a champion that it was he who gave Jussac the terrible sword-thrust which has made the cardinal so angry. "'He who wounded Jussac!' cried the king. "'He, a boy! <laughs> Treville, that's impossible!' "'It is as I have the honour to relate it to your majesty.' "'Jussac, one of the first swordsmen in the kingdom!' Well, sire, for once he found his master. I will see this young man, Treville. I will see him. And if anything can be done, well, we will make it our business. When will your majesty deign to receive him? Tomorrow at midday, Treville. Shall I bring him alone? Uh, no, bring me all four together. I wish to thank them all at once. Devoted men are so rare, Treville. By the back staircase. It is useless to let the cardinal know. Yes, sire. You understand, Treville. An edict is still an edict. It is forbidden to fight, after all. But this encounter, sire, is quite out of the ordinary conditions of a duel. It is a brawl, and the proof is that there were five of the cardinal's guardsmen against my three musketeers and Monsieur d'Artagnan. 
"'That is true,' said the king. "'But never mind, Treville. Come still by the back staircase.' Treville smiled, but as it was indeed something to have prevailed upon this child to rebel against his master, he saluted the king respectfully, and with this agreement took leave of him. That evening the three musketeers were informed of the honour accorded them. As they had long been acquainted with the king, they were not much excited, but D'Artagnan, with his Gascon imagination, saw in it his future fortune, and passed the night in golden dreams. By eight o'clock in the morning he was at the apartment of Athos. D'Artagnan found the musketeer dressed and ready to go out. As the hour to wait upon the king was not till twelve, he had made a party with Porthos and Aramis to play a game at tennis in a tennis court situated near the stables of the Luxembourg. Athos invited D'Artagnan to follow them, and although ignorant of the game, which he had never played, he accepted, not knowing what to do with his time from nine o'clock in the morning, as it then scarcely was, till twelve. The two musketeers were already there, and were playing together. Athos, who was very expert in all bodily exercises, passed with D'Artagnan to the opposite side and challenged them. But at the first effort he made, although he played with his left hand, he found that his wound was yet too recent to allow of such exertion. D'Artagnan remained, therefore, alone, and as he declared he was too ignorant of the game to play it regularly, they only continued giving balls to one another without counting. But one of these balls, launched by Porthos's Herculean hand, passed so close to D'Artagnan's face that he thought that if, instead of passing near, it had hit him, his audience would have been probably lost, as it would have been impossible for him to present himself before the king. Now, as upon this audience, in his Gascon imagination, depended his future life, he saluted Aramis and Porthos politely declaring that he would not resume the game until he should be prepared to play with them on more equal terms, and went and took his place near the cord and in the gallery. Unfortunately for D'Artagnan, among the spectators was one of his eminence's guardsmen, who, still irritated by the defeat of his companions, which had happened only the day before, had promised himself to seize the first opportunity of avenging it. He believed this opportunity was now come, and addressed his neighbour. "'It is not astonishing that that young man should be afraid of a ball, for he is doubtless a musketeer apprentice.' D'Artagnan turned round as if a serpent had stung him, and fixed his eyes intensely upon the guardsman who had just made this insolent speech. "'Pardieu!' resumed the latter, twisting his moustache. "'Look at me as long as you like, my little gentleman.' I have said what I have said. And as since that which you have said is too clear to require any explanation, replied D'Artagnan in a low voice, I beg you to follow me. And when? asked the guardsman with the same jeering air. At once, if you please. And you know who I am, without doubt? I? I am completely ignorant, nor does it much disquiet me. "'You're in the wrong there, for if you knew my name, perhaps you would not be so pressing. "'What is your name?' "'Bernajou, at your service.' "'Well, then, Monsieur Bernajou,' said D'Artagnan tranquilly, "'I will wait for you at the door. "'Go, Monsieur, I will follow you. "'Do not hurry yourself, Monsieur, unless it be observed that we go out together. "'You must be aware that for our undertaking—' company would be in the way that's true said the guardsman astonished that his name had not produced more effect upon the young man indeed the name of bernajou was known to all the world d'artagnan alone excepted perhaps for it was one of those which figured most frequently in the daily brawls which all the edicts of the cardinal could not repress porthos and aramis were so engaged with their game and Athos was watching them with so much attention that they did not even perceive their young companion go out, who, as he had told the guardsman of his eminence, stopped outside the door. An instant after, the guardsman descended in his turn. 
as d'artagnan had no time to lose on account of the audience of the king which was fixed for midday he cast his eyes around and seeing that the street was empty said to his adversary my faith it is fortunate for you although your name is bernachou to have only to deal with an apprentice musketeer never mind be content i will do my best on guard but said he whom d'artagnan thus provoked it appears to me that this place is badly chosen and that we should be better behind the abbe saint germain or in the prix aux clairs what you say is full of sense replied d'artagnan but unfortunately i have very little time to spare having an appointment at twelve precisely on guard then monsieur on guard bernajou was not a man to have such a compliment paid to him twice in an instant his sword glittered in his hand and he sprang upon his adversary whom thanks to his great youthfulness he hoped to intimidate but d'artagnan had on the preceding day served his apprenticeship fresh sharpened by his victory full of hopes of future favour he was resolved not to recoil a step so the two swords were crossed close to the hilts and as d'artagnan stood firm it was his adversary who made the retreating step but d'artagnan seized the moment at which in this movement the sword of bernajou deviated from the line he freed his weapon made a lunge and touched his adversary on the shoulder d'artagnan immediately made a step backward and raised his sword but bernajou cried out that it was nothing and rushing blindly upon him absolutely spitted himself upon d'artagnan's sword as however he did not fall as he did not declare himself conquered but only broke away toward the hotel of monsieur de la tremouille in whose service he had a relative d'artagnan was ignorant of the seriousness of the last wound his adversary had received and pressing him warmly without doubt would soon have completed his work with a third blow when the noise which arose from the street being heard in the tennis court two of the friends of the guardsman who had seen him go out after exchanging some words with d'artagnan rushed sword in hand from the court and fell upon the conqueror but athos porthos and aramis quickly appeared in their turn and the moment the two guardsmen attacked their young companion drove them back bernajou now fell and as the guardsmen were only two against four they began to cry to the rescue the hotel de la tremouille at these cries all who were in the hotel rushed out and fell upon the four companions who on their side cried aloud to the rescue musketeers this cry was generally heeded for the musketeers were known to be enemies of the cardinal and were beloved on account of the hatred they bore to his eminence thus the soldiers of other companies than those which belonged to the red duke as aramis had called him often took part with the king's musketeers in these quarrels a three guardsmen of the company of monsieur dessessart who were passing two came to the assistance of the four companions while the other ran toward the hotel of monsieur de treville crying to the rescue musketeers to the rescue as usual this hotel was full of soldiers of this company who hastened to the succour of their comrades the melee became general but strength was on the side of the musketeers the cardinal's guards and monsieur de la tremille's people retreated into the hotel the doors of which they closed just in time to prevent their enemies from entering with them as to the wounded man he had been taken in at once and as we have said in a very bad state excitement was at its height among the musketeers and their allies and they even began to deliberate whether they should not set fire to the hotel to punish the insolence of m de la tremille's domestics in daring to make a sortie upon the king's musketeers the proposition had been made and received with enthusiasm when fortunately eleven o'clock struck d'artagnan and his companions remembered their audience and as they would very much have regretted that such an opportunity should be lost they succeeded in calming their friends who contented themselves with hurling some paving stones against the gates but the gates were too strong they soon tired of the sport besides those who must be considered the leaders of the enterprise had quit the group and were making their way toward the hotel of m de treville who was waiting for them 
already informed of this fresh disturbance. "'Quick to the Louvre,' said he. "'To the Louvre, without losing an instant, and let us endeavour to see the king before he is prejudiced by the cardinal. We will describe the thing to him as a consequence of the affair of yesterday, and the two will pass off together.' M. de Treville, accompanied by the four young fellows, directed his course toward the Louvre, but to the great astonishment of the captain of the musketeers, he was informed that the king had gone stag-hunting in the forest of Saint-Germain. M. de Treville required this intelligence to be repeated to him twice, and each time his companions saw his brow become darker. "'Had his majesty,' asked he, any intention of holding this hunting party yesterday no your excellency replied the valet de chambre the master of the hounds came this morning to inform him that he had marked down a stag at first the king answered that he would not go but he could not resist his love of sport and set out after dinner and the king has seen the cardinal asked monsieur de treville in all probability he has replied the valet for i saw the horses harnessed to his eminence's carriage this morning and when i asked where he was going they told me to saint germain he is beforehand with us said monsieur de treville gentlemen i will see the king this evening but as to you i do not advise you to risk doing so this advice was too reasonable, and moreover came from a man who knew the king too well to allow the four young men to dispute it. M. de Treville recommended everyone to return home and wait for news. On entering his hotel, M. de Treville thought it best to be first in making the complaint. He sent one of his servants to M. de la Tremille with a letter in which he begged of him to eject the cardinal's guardsman from his house and to reprimand his people for their audacity in making sortie against the king's musketeers. But M. de la Tremille, already prejudiced by his esquire, whose relative, as we already know, Bernajou was, replied that it was neither for M. de Treville nor the musketeers to complain, but on the contrary, for him, whose people the musketeers had assaulted, and whose hotel they had endeavoured to burn now as the debate between these two nobles might last a long time each becoming naturally more firm in his own opinion m de treville thought of an expedient which might terminate it quietly this was to go himself to m de la tremille he repaired therefore immediately to his hotel and caused himself to be announced the two nobles saluted each other politely for if no friendship existed between them there was at least esteem. Both were men of courage and honour, and as M. de la Tremille, a Protestant, and seeing the king seldom, was of no party, he did not in general carry any bias into his social relations. This time, however, his address, although polite, was cooler than usual. Monsieur, said M. de Treville, we fancy that we have each cause to complain of the other, and I am come to endeavour to clear up this affair. I have no objection, replied M. de la Tremille, but I warn you that I am well informed, and all the fault is with your musketeers. You are too just and reasonable a man, monsieur, said Treville, not to accept the proposal I am about to make to you make it monsieur i listen how is monsieur bernajou your esquire's relative why monsieur very ill indeed in addition to the sword thrust in his arm which is not dangerous he has received another right through his lungs of which the doctor says bad things but has the wounded man retained his senses perfectly does he talk with difficulty but he can speak well, monsieur, let us go to him. Let us adjure him, in the name of the God before whom he must perhaps appear, to speak the truth. I will take him for judge in his own cause, monsieur, and will believe what he will say. Monsieur de la Tremille reflected for an instant, then, as it was difficult to suggest a more reasonable proposal, he agreed to it. 
both descended to the chamber in which the wounded man lay. The latter, on seeing these two noble lords who came to visit him, endeavoured to raise himself up in his bed, but he was too weak, and exhausted by the effort, he fell back again almost senseless. Monsieur de la Tremille approached him, and made him inhale some salts which recalled him to life. Then M. de Treville, unwilling that it should be thought that he had influenced the wounded man, requested M. de la Tremille to interrogate him himself. That happened which M. de Treville had foreseen. Placed between life and death as Bernajou was, he had no idea for a moment of concealing the truth, and he described to the two nobles the affair exactly as it had passed. This was all that M. de Treville wanted. He wished Bernajou a speedy convalescence, took leave of M. de la Tremille, returned to his hotel, and immediately sent word to the four friends that he awaited their company at dinner. M. de Treville entertained good company, wholly anti-cardinalist, though. It may easily be understood, therefore, that the conversation during the whole of dinner turned upon the two checks that his eminence's guardsmen had received. Now, as D'Artagnan had been the hero of these two fights, it was upon him that all the felicitations fell, which Athos, Porthos, and Aramis abandoned to him, not only as good comrades, but as men who had so often had their turn that they could very well afford him his. Towards six o'clock, M. de Treville announced that it was time to go to the Louvre, but as the hour of audience granted by His Majesty was past, Instead of claiming the entrée by the back stairs, he placed himself with the four young men in the antechamber. The king had not yet returned from hunting. Our young men had been waiting about half an hour, amid a crowd of courtiers, when all the doors were thrown open, and his majesty was announced. At his announcement, D'Artagnan felt himself tremble to the very marrow of his bones. The coming instant would in all probability decide the rest of his life. His eyes, therefore, were fixed in a sort of agony upon the door through which the king must enter. Louis the Thirteenth appeared, walking fast. He was in hunting costume, covered with dust, wearing large boots, and holding a whip in his hand. At the first glance, D'Artagnan judged that the mind of the king was stormy. This disposition, visible as it was in his majesty, did not prevent the courtiers from ranging themselves along his pathway. In royal antechambers it is worth more to be viewed with an angry eye than not to be seen at all. The three musketeers, therefore, did not hesitate to make a step forward. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, remained concealed behind them. But although the king knew Athos, Porthos, and Aramis personally, he passed before them without speaking or looking, indeed, as if he had never seen them before. As for M. de Treville, when the eyes of the king fell upon him, he sustained the look with so much firmness that it was the king who dropped his eyes, after which his majesty, grumbling, entered his apartment. "'Matters go but badly,' said Athos, smiling, "'and we shall not be made chevaliers of the order this time.' "'Wait here ten minutes,' said Monsieur de Treville. And if at the expiration of ten minutes you do not see me come out, return to my hotel, for it will be useless for you to wait for me longer. The four young men waited ten minutes, a quarter of an hour, twenty minutes, and seeing that M. de Treville did not return, went away very uneasy as to what was going to happen. M. de Treville entered the king's cabinet boldly, and found his majesty in a very ill humour seated on an armchair, beating his boot with the handle of his whip. This, however, did not prevent his asking, with the greatest coolness, after His Majesty's health. "'Bad, monsieur, bad,' replied the king. "'I am bored.' This was, in fact, the worst complaint of Louis the Thirteenth, who would sometimes take one of his courtiers to a window and say, "'Monsieur so-and-so, let us weary ourselves together.' How? Your Majesty is bored? Have you not enjoyed the pleasures of the chase today? 
a fine pleasure indeed monsieur upon my soul everything degenerates and i don't know whether it is the game which leaves no scent or the dogs that have no noses we started a stag of ten branches we chased him for six hours and when he was near being taken when saint simon was already putting his horn to his mouth to sound the mort crack all the pack takes the wrong scent and sets off after a two-year-older i shall be obliged to give up hunting as i have given up hawking ah i am an unfortunate king monsieur de treville i had but one gerfalcon and he died day before yesterday indeed sire i wholly comprehend your disappointment the misfortune is great but i think you still have a good number of falcons sparrowhawks and tiercels and not a man to instruct them falconers are declining i know no one but myself who is acquainted with the noble art of venery after me it will all be over and people will hunt with gins snares and traps if i had but the time to train pupils but there is the cardinal always at hand who does not leave me a moment's repose who talks to me about spain who talks to me about austria who talks to me about england ah apropos of the cardinal monsieur de treville ah, i am vexed with you this was the chance at which monsieur de treville waited for the king he knew the king of old and he knew that all these complaints were but a preface a sort of excitation to encourage himself and that he had now come to his point at last and in what have i been so unfortunate as to displease your majesty asked m de treville feigning the most profound astonishment is it thus you perform your charge monsieur continued the king without directly replying to de treville's question is it for this i name you captain of my musketeers that they should assassinate a man disturb a whole quarter and endeavour to set fire to paris without your saying a word but yet continued the king undoubtedly my haste accuses you wrongfully without doubt the rioters are in prison and you come to tell me justice is done sire replied m de treville calmly on the contrary i come to demand it of you and against whom cried the king against calumniators said m de treville ah this is something new replied the king will you tell me that your three damned musketeers athos porthos and aramis and your youngster from berne have not fallen like so many furies upon poor bernajou and have not maltreated him in such a fashion that probably by this time he is dead will you tell me that they did not lay siege to the hotel of duc de la tremouille and that they did not endeavour to burn it which would not perhaps have been a great misfortune in time of war seeing that it is nothing but a nest of huguenots but which is in time of peace a frightful example tell me now can you deny all this and who has told you this fine story sire asked treville quietly who has told me this fine story monsieur who should it be but he who watches while i sleep who labours while i amuse myself who conducts everything at home and abroad in france as in europe your majesty probably refers to god said m de treville for i know no one except god who can be so far above your majesty no monsieur i speak of the prop of the state of my only servant of my only friend of the cardinal his eminence is not his holiness sire what do you mean by that monsieur that it is only the pope who is infallible and that this infallibility does not extend to cardinals you mean to say that he deceives me you mean to say that he betrays me you accuse him then come speak avow freely that you accuse him no sire but i say that he deceives himself i say that he is ill-informed 
I say that he has hastily accused your majesty's musketeers, toward whom he is unjust, and that he has not obtained his information from good sources. The accusation comes from Monsieur de la Tremille, from the Duke himself. What do you say to that? I might answer, sire, that he is too deeply interested in the question to be a very impartial witness. But so far from that, sire, I know the Duke to be a royal gentleman, and I refer the matter to him, but upon one condition, sire. What? It is that your majesty will make him come here, will interrogate him yourself, tete-a-tete, -tete, without witnesses, and that I shall see your majesty as soon as you have seen the Duke. "'What, then? You will bind yourself?' cried the king. "'By what Monsieur de la Tremille shall say?' "'Yes, sire.' "'You will accept his judgment?' "'Undoubtedly.' "'And you will submit to the reparation he may require?' "'Certainly.' "'La Chesnay,' said the king. "'La Chesnay!' Louis the Thirteenth's confidential valet, who never left the door, entered in reply to the call. "'La Chesnay,' said the king, "'let someone go instantly and find Monsieur de la Tremille. I wish to speak with him this evening.' "'Your Majesty gives me your word that you will not see anyone between Monsieur de la Tremille and myself?' "'Nobody, by the faith of a gentleman.' "'Tomorrow, then, sire?' "'Tomorrow, monsieur.' "'At what o'clock, please, your majesty?' "'At any hour you will.' "'But in coming too early, I should be afraid of awakening your majesty.' "'Awaken me? <laughs> Do you think I ever sleep, then? I sleep no longer, monsieur. I sometimes dream, that's all. Come, then, as early as you like, at seven o'clock. But beware, if you and your musketeers are guilty—' If my musketeers are guilty, sire, the guilty shall be placed in your majesty's hands, who will dispose of them at your good pleasure. Does your majesty require anything further? Speak, I am ready to obey. No, monsieur, no. I am not called Louis the Just without reason. Tomorrow, then, monsieur, tomorrow. Till then, God preserve your majesty. However ill the king might sleep, Monsieur de Treville slept still worse. He had ordered his three musketeers and their companion to be with him at half-past six in the morning. He took them with him, without encouraging them or promising them anything, and without concealing from them that their luck, and even his own, depended upon the cast of the dice. Arrived at the foot of the back stairs, he desired them to wait. If the king was still irritated against them, they would depart without being seen. If the king consented to see them, they would only have to be called. On arriving at the king's private antechamber, M. de Treville found La Chesnay, who informed him that they had not been able to find M. de la Tremille on the preceding evening at his hotel, that he returned too late to present himself at the Louvre, that he had only that moment arrived, and that he was at that very hour with the king. This circumstance pleased M. de Treville much, as he thus became certain that no foreign suggestion could insinuate itself between M. de la Tremille's testimony and himself. In fact, ten minutes had scarcely passed away when the door of the king's closet opened, and M. de Treville saw M. de la Tremille come out. The duke came straight up to him, and said, M. de Treville, his Majesty has just sent for me in order to inquire respecting the circumstances which took place yesterday at my hotel. I have told him the truth, that is to say, that the fault lay with my people, and that I was ready to offer you my excuses. Since I have the good of fortune to meet you, I beg you to receive them, and to hold me always as one of your friends. Monsieur the Duke, said Monsieur de Treville. I was so confident of your loyalty that I required no other defender before His Majesty than yourself. I find that I have not been mistaken, and I thank you that there is still one man in France of whom may be said, without disappointment, what I have said of you. "'That's well said,' 
cried the king, who had heard all these compliments through the open door. "'Only tell him, Treville, since he wishes to be considered your friend, that I also wish to be one of his. But he neglects me, that it is nearly three years since I have seen him, and that I never do see him unless I send for him. Tell him all this for me, for these are things which a king cannot say for himself.' "'Thanks, sire, thanks,' said the duke. "'But your majesty may be assured that it is not those—I do not speak of Monsieur de Treville, whom your majesty sees at all hours of the day that are most devoted to you.' "'Ah! You have heard what I said. So much the better, duke, so much the better,' said the king, advancing toward the door. "'Ah! It is you, Treville. Where are your musketeers?' I told you the day before yesterday to bring them with you. Why have you not done so? They are below, sire, and with your permission, La Chesnay will bid them come up. Yes, yes, let them come up immediately. It is nearly eight o'clock, and at nine I expect a visit. Go, Monsieur Duke, and return often. Come in, Treville. The Duke saluted and retired. At the moment he opened the door, the three musketeers and D'Artagnan, conducted by La Chesnay, appeared at the top of the staircase. "'Come in, my braves,' said the king. "'Come in! I am going to scold you!' The musketeers advanced, bowing, D'Artagnan following closely behind them. "'What the devil!' continued the king. Seven of his eminence's guards place hors de combat by you four in two days. That's too many, gentlemen, too many!' If you go on so, his eminence will be forced to renew his company in three weeks, and I to put the edicts in force in all their rigor. One now and then I don't say much about, but seven and two days, I repeat, it is too many. It is far too many. Therefore, sire, your majesty sees that they are come, quite contrite and repentant, to offer you their excuses." "'Quite contrite and repented. Hem!' said the king. "'I place no confidence in their hypocritical faces. "'In particular, there is one yonder of a Gascon look. "'Come hither, monsieur.' "'D'Artagnan, who understood that it was to him this compliment was addressed, "'approached, assuming a most deprecating air. "'Why, you told me he was a young man?' This is a boy, Treville, a mere boy. Do you mean to say that it was he who bestowed that severe thrust at Jussac? And those two equally fine thrusts at Bernajou. Truly. Without reckoning, said Athos, that if he had not rescued me from the hands of Cahusac, I should not now have the honor of making my very humble reverence to your majesty. Why, he is a very devil, this Baronet! Fond your sangree, Monsieur de Treville, as the father my king would have said. But at this sort of work, many doublets must be slashed and many swords broken. Now, Gascons are always poor, are they not? Sire, I can assert that they have hitherto discovered no gold mines in their mountains, though the Lord owes them this miracle in recompense for the manner in which they supported the pretensions of the king your father. Which is to say that the Gascons made a king of me, myself, seeing that I am my father's son, is it not, Treville? Well, happily, I don't say nay to it. La Chesnay, go and see if by rummaging all my pockets you can find forty pistoles, and if you can find them, bring them to me. And now let us see, young man, with your hand upon your conscience, how did all this come to pass? D'Artagnan related the adventure of the preceding day in all its details, how, not having been able to sleep for the joy he felt in the expectation of seeing his majesty, he had gone to his three friends three hours before the hour of audience, how they had gone together to the tennis court, and how, upon the fear he had manifested, lest he receive a ball in the face, he had been jeered at by Bernajou, who had nearly paid for his jeer with his life, and Monsieur de la Tremille, who had nothing to do with the matter, with the loss of his hotel. "'This is all very well,' murmured the king. "'Yes, 
This is just the account the Duke gave me of the affair. Poor Cardinal! Seven men in two days, and those of his very best. But that's quite enough, gentlemen. Please to understand, that's enough. You have taken your revenge for the Rue Ferru, and even exceeded it. You ought to be satisfied. If your majesty is so, said Treville, we are. Oh, yes, I am, added the king, taking a handful of gold from La Chesnay, and putting it into the hand of D'Artagnan. Here, said he, is a proof of my satisfaction. At this epoch, the ideas of pride which are in fashion in our days did not prevail. A gentleman received, from hand to hand, money from the king, and was not the least in the world humiliated. D'Artagnan put his forty pistoles into his pocket without any scruple, on the contrary, thanking his majesty greatly. "'There,' said the king, looking at a clock, "'there now, it is half-past eight. You may retire, for, as I told you, I expect someone at nine. "'Thanks for your devotedness, gentlemen. I may continue to rely upon it, may I not?' "'Oh, sire!' cried the four companions, with one voice. "'We would allow ourselves to be cut to pieces in your majesty's service.' "'Well, well, but keep whole. That will be better, and you will be more useful to me.' "'Treville,' added the king, in a low voice, as the others were retiring, "'as you have no room in the musketeers, and as we have besides decided that a novitiate is necessary before entering that corps,' Place this young man in the company of the guards of Monsieur Dessessart, your brother-in-law. Oh, par Dieu, Treville, I enjoy beforehand the face the cardinal will make. He will be furious, but I don't care. I am doing what is right. The king waved his hand to Treville, who left him and rejoined the musketeers, whom he found sharing the forty pistoles with D'Artagnan. The cardinal, as his majesty had said, was really furious, so furious that during eight days he absented himself from the king's gaming-table. This did not prevent the king from being as complacent to him as possible whenever he met him, or from asking in the kindest tone, "'Well, Monsieur Cardinal, how fares it with that poor Jussac and that poor Bernajou of yours?' End of chapter Chapter Seven of the Three Musketeers, the Interior of the Musketeers. When D'Artagnan was out of the Louvre and consulted with his friends upon the use he had best make of his share of the forty pistoles, Athos advised him to order a good repast at the Pomme de Pin, Porthos to engage a lackey, and Aramis to provide himself with a suitable mistress. The repast was carried into effect that very day and the lackey waited at table. The repast had been ordered by Athos, and the lackey furnished by Porthos. He was a Picard, whom the glorious musketeer had picked up on the bridge Tourneul, making rings and plashing in the water. Porthos pretended that this occupation was proof of a reflective and contemplative organization, and he had brought him away without any other recommendation. The noble carriage of this gentleman, for whom he believed himself to be engaged, had won Planchet. That was the name of the Picard. He felt a slight disappointment, however, when he saw that this place was already taken by a compere named Mousqueton, and when Porthos signified to him that the state of his household, though great, would not support two servants, and that he must enter into the service of D'Artagnan. Nevertheless, when he waited at the dinner given by his master, and saw him take out a handful of gold to pay for it, he believed his fortune made, and returned thanks to heaven for having thrown him into the service of such a Croesus. He preserved this opinion even after the feast, with the remnants of which he repaired his own long abstinence, but when in the evening he made his master's bed, the chimeras of Planchet faded away. The bed was the only one in the apartment which consisted of an antechamber and a bedroom. Planchet slept in the antechamber upon a coverlet taken from the bed of D'Artagnan, and which D'Artagnan from that time made shift to do without. 
Athos, on his part, had a valet whom he had trained in his service in a thoroughly peculiar fashion, and who was named Grimaud. He was very taciturn, this worthy seigneur. Be it understood we are speaking of Athos. During the five or six years that he had lived in the strictest intimacy with his companions, Porthos and Aramis, they could remember having often seen him smile, but had never heard him laugh. His words were brief and expressive, conveying all that was meant, and no more, no embellishments, no embroidery, no arabesques. His conversation was a matter of fact, without a single romance. Although Athos was scarcely thirty years old, and was of great personal beauty and intelligence of mind, no one knew whether he had ever had a mistress. He never spoke of women. He certainly did not prevent others from speaking of them before him, although it was easy to perceive that this kind of conversation, in which he only mingled by bitter words and misanthropic remarks, was very disagreeable to him. His reserve, his roughness, and his silence made almost an old man of him. He had, then, in order not to disturb his habits, accustomed Grimaud to obey him upon a simple gesture, or upon a simple movement of his lips. He never spoke to him, except under the most extraordinary occasions. Sometimes Grimaud, who feared his master as he did fire, while entertaining a strong attachment to his person and a great veneration for his talents, believed he perfectly understood what he wanted, flew to execute the order received, and did precisely the contrary. Athos then shrugged his shoulders, and, without putting himself in a passion, thrashed Grimaud. On these days he spoke a little. Porthos, as we have seen, had a character exactly opposite to that of Athos. He not only talked much, but he talked loudly, little caring, we must render him that justice, whether anybody listened to him or not. He talked for the pleasure of talking, and for the pleasure of hearing himself talk. He spoke upon all subjects except the sciences, alleging in this respect the inveterate hatred he had borne to scholars from his childhood. He had not so noble an air as Athos, and the commencement of their intimacy often rendered him unjust toward that gentleman, whom he endeavoured to eclipse by his splendid dress. But with his simple musketeer's uniform, and nothing but the manner in which he threw back his head and advanced his foot, Athos instantly took the place which was his due, and consigned the ostentatious Porthos to the second rank. Porthos consoled himself by filling the antechamber of M. de Treville and the guard-room of the Louvre with the accounts of his love-scrapes, after having passed from professional ladies to military ladies, from the lawyer's dame to the baroness, there was question of nothing less with Porthos than a foreign princess, who was enormously fond of him. An old proverb says, like master, like man. Let us pass then from the valet of Athos to the valet of Porthos, from Grimaud to Mousqueton. Mousqueton was a Norman, whose pacific name of Boniface his master had changed into the infinitely more sonorous name of Mousqueton. He had entered the service of Porthos upon condition that he should only be clothed and lodged, though in a handsome manner, but he claimed two hours a day to himself, consecrated to an employment which would provide for his other wants. Porthos agreed to the bargain. The thing suited him wonderfully well. He had doublets cut out of his old clothes and cast-off cloaks for Mousqueton, and thanks to a very intelligent tailor, who made his clothes look as good as new by turning them, and whose wife was suspected of wishing to make Porthos descend from his aristocratic habits, Mousqueton made a very good figure when attending upon his master. As for Aramis, of whom we believe we have sufficiently explained the character, a character which, like that of his companions, we shall be able to follow in its development. His lackey was called Bazin. Thanks to the hopes which his master entertained of some day entering into orders, he was always clothed in black, as became the servant of a churchman. He was a barracon, thirty-five or forty years old, mild, peaceable, sleek, employing the leisure his master left him in the perusal of pious works, 
providing rigorously for two a dinner of few dishes but excellent. For the rest he was dumb, blind, and deaf, and of unimpeachable fidelity. And now that we are acquainted, superficially at least, with the masters and the valets, let us pass on to the dwellings occupied by each of them. Athos dwelt in the Rue Ferru, within two steps of the Luxembourg. His apartment consisted of two small chambers, very nicely fitted up, in a furnished house, the hostess of which, still young and still really handsome, cast tender glances uselessly at him. Some fragments of past splendour appeared here and there upon the walls of this modest lodging. A sword, for example, richly embossed, which belonged by its make to the times of Francis I, the hilt of which alone, encrusted with precious stones, might be worth two hundred pistoles, and which nevertheless, in his moments of greatest distress, Athos had never pledged or offered for sale. It had long been an object of ambition for Porthos. Porthos would have given ten years of his life to possess this sword. One day, when he had an appointment with the Duchess, he endeavoured even to borrow it of Athos. Athos, without saying anything, emptied his pockets, got together all his jewels, purses, aiguillettes, and gold chains, and offered them all to Porthos. But as to the sword, he said it was sealed to its place and should never quit it until its master should himself quit his lodgings. In addition to the sword, there was a portrait representing a nobleman of the time of Henry the Third, dressed with the greatest elegance, and who wore the order of the Holy Ghost. And this portrait had certain resemblances of lines with Athos, certain family likenesses which indicated that this great noble, a knight of the order of the king, was his ancestor. Besides these, a casket of magnificent gold-work, with the same arms as the sword and the portrait, formed a middle ornament to the mantelpiece, and assorted badly with the rest of the furniture. Athos always carried the key of this coffer about him, but he one day opened it before Porthos, and Porthos was convinced that this coffer contained nothing but letters and papers, love-letters and family papers, no doubt. Porthos lived in an apartment, large in size and of very sumptuous appearance, in the Rue de Vieux Colombier. Every time he passed with a friend before his windows, at one of which Mousqueton was sure to be placed in full livery, Porthos raised his head and his hand and said, "'That is my abode!' But he was never to be found at home. He never invited anybody to go up with him and no one could form an idea of what his sumptuous apartment contained in the shape of real riches. As to Aramis, he dwelt in a little lodging composed of a boudoir, an eating-room, and a bedroom, which room, situated, as the others were, on the ground floor, looked out upon a little fresh green garden, shady and impenetrable to the eyes of his neighbours. With regard to D'Artagnan, we know how he was lodged, and we have already made acquaintance with his lackey, Master Planchet. D'Artagnan, who was by nature very curious, as people generally are who possess the genius of intrigue, did all he could to make out who Athos, Porthos, and Aramis really were. For under these pseudonyms each of these young men concealed his family name. Athos, in particular, who, a league away, savoured of nobility. He addressed himself then to Porthos to gain information respecting Athos and Aramis, and to Aramis in order to learn something of Porthos. Unfortunately, Porthos knew nothing of the life of his silent companion but what revealed itself. It was said Athos had met with great crosses in love, and that a frightful treachery had forever poisoned the life of this gallant man. What could this treachery be? All the world was ignorant of it. As to Porthos, except his real name, as was the case with those of his two comrades, his life was very easily known. Vain and indiscreet, it was as easy to see through him as through a crystal. The only thing to mislead the investigator would have been belief in all the good things he said of himself. With respect to Aramis, though having the air of having nothing sacred about him, 
he was a young fellow made up of mysteries, answering little to questions put to him about others, and having learned from him the report which prevailed concerning the success of the musketeer with a princess, wished to gain a little insight into the amorous adventures of his interlocutor. "'And you, my dear companion,' said he, "'you speak of the baronesses, the countesses, and princesses of others?' "'Pardieu, I spoke of them because Porthos talked of them himself, because he had paraded all these fine things before me. But be assured, my dear Monsieur d'Artagnan, that if I had obtained them from any other source, or if they had been confided to me, there exists no confessor more discreet than myself. Oh, I don't doubt that, replied D'Artagnan, but it seems to me that you are tolerably familiar with coats of arms, a certain embroidered handkerchief, for instance, to which I owe the honour of your acquaintance. This time Aramis was not angry, but assumed the most modest air, and replied in a friendly tone, My dear friend, do not forget that I wish to belong to the church, and that I avoid all mundane opportunities. The handkerchief you saw had not been given to me, but it had been forgotten and left at my house by one of my friends. I was obliged to pick it up in order not to compromise him and the lady he loves. As for myself, I neither have nor desire to have a mistress, following in that respect the very judicious example of Athos, who is none any more than I have. "'But what the devil! You are not a priest, you are a musketeer!' "'A musketeer for a time, my friend. As the cardinal says, a musketeer against my will, but a churchman at heart, believe me. Athos and Porthos dragged me into this to occupy me. I had, at the moment of being ordained, a little difficulty with— But that would not interest you, and I am taking up your valuable time. "'Not at all. It interests me very much,' cried D'Artagnan. "'And at this moment I have absolutely nothing to do.' "'Yes, but I have my breviary to repeat,' answered Aramis. "'Then some verses to compose, which Madame d'Aguillon begged of me. "'Then I must go to the Rue saint honore in order to purchase some rouge for Madame de Chevreuse. "'So you see, my dear friend—' that if you are not in a hurry, I am very much in a hurry." Aramis held out his hand in a cordial manner to his young companion, and took leave of him. Notwithstanding all the pains he took, D'Artagnan was unable to learn any more concerning his three new-made friends. He formed, therefore, the resolution of believing for the present all that was said of their past, hoping for more certain and extended revelations in the future. In the meanwhile, he looked upon Athos as an Achilles, Porthos as an Ajax, and Aramis as a Joseph. As to the rest, the life of the four young friends was joyous enough. Athos played, and that as a rule, unfortunately. Nevertheless, he never borrowed a sou of his companions, although his purse was ever at their service, and when he had played upon honour, he always awakened his creditor by six o'clock the next morning to pay the debt of the preceding evening. Porthos had his fits. On the days when he won he was insolent and ostentatious. If he lost, he disappeared completely for several days, after which he reappeared with a pale face and thinner person, but with money in his purse. As to Aramis, he never played. He was the worst musketeer and the most unconvivial companion imaginable. He had always something or other to do. Sometimes in the midst of dinner, when every one, under the attraction of wine and in the warmth of conversation, believed they had two or three hours longer to enjoy themselves at table, Aramis looked at his watch, arose with a bland smile, and took leave of the company, to go, as he said, to consult a casuist with whom he had an appointment. At other times he would return home to write a treatise, and requested his friends not to disturb him. At this Athos would smile, with his charming melancholy smile, which so became his noble countenance, and Porthos would drink, swearing that Aramis would never be anything but a village curé. Planchet, 
d'Artagnan's valet, supported his good fortune nobly. He received thirty sous per day, and for a month he returned to his lodgings gay as a chaffinch, and affable toward his master. When the wind of adversity began to blow upon the housekeeping of the Rue des Fosseurs, that is to say, when the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth were consumed, or nearly so, he commenced complaints which Athos thought nauseous, Porthos indecent, and Aramis ridiculous. Athos counselled D'Artagnan to dismiss the fellow. Porthos was of the opinion that he should give him a good thrashing first, and Aramis contended that a master should never attend to anything but the civilities paid to him. "'This is all very easy for you to say,' replied D'Artagnan. "'For you, Athos, who live like a dumb man with Grimaud, who forbid him to speak, and consequently never exchange ill words with him. For you, Porthos, who carry matters in such a magnificent style, and are a god to your valet, Mousqueton. And for you, Aramis, who, always abstracted by your theological studies, inspire your servant, Bazin, a mild religious man, with a profound respect. But for me, who am without any settled means and without resources, for me, who am neither a musketeer nor even a guardsman, what am I to do to inspire either the affection, the terror, or the respect in Planchet? This is serious, answered the three friends. It is a family affair. It is with valets as with wives. They must be placed at once upon the footing in which you wish them to remain. Reflect upon it. D'Artagnan did reflect, and resolved to thrash Planchet provisionally which he did with the conscientiousness that D'Artagnan carried into everything. After having well beaten him, he forbade him to leave his service without his permission. For, added he, the future cannot fail to mend. I inevitably look for better times. Your fortune is therefore made if you remain with me, and I am too good a master to allow you to miss such a chance by granting you the dismissal you require." This manner of acting roused much respect for D'Artagnan's policy among the musketeers. Planchet was equally seized with admiration, and said no more about going away. The life of the four young men had become fraternal. D'Artagnan, who had no settled habits of his own, as he came from his province into the midst of a world quite new to him, fell easily into the habits of his friends. They rose about eight o'clock in the winter— about six in summer, and went to take the countersign and see how things went on at M. de Treville's. D'Artagnan, although he was not a musketeer, performed the duty of one with remarkable punctuality. He went on guard because he always kept company with whoever of his friends was on duty. He was well known at the Hotel of the Musketeers, where everyone considered him a good comrade. M. de Treville, who had appreciated him at the first glance, and who bore him a real affection, never ceased recommending him to the king. On their side, the three musketeers were much attached to their young comrade. The friendship which united these four men, and the need they felt of seeing another three or four times a day, whether for dueling, business, or pleasure, caused them to be continually running after one another like shadows, and the inseparables were constantly to be met with seeking one another, from the Luxembourg to the Place Saint-Sulpice, or from the Rue de vieux Colombier to the Luxembourg. In the meantime, the promises of M. de Treville went on prosperously. One fine morning the king commanded M. de Chevalier de Cessar to admit D'Artagnan as a cadet in his company of guards. D'Artagnan, with a sigh, donned his uniform, which he would have exchanged for that of a musketeer, at the expense of ten years of his existence. But M. de Treville promised this favour after a novitiate of two years, a novitiate which might besides be abridged if an opportunity should present itself for D'Artagnan to render the king any signal service, or to distinguish himself by some brilliant action. Upon this promise D'Artagnan withdrew, and the next day he began service. Then it became the turn of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis to mount guard with D'Artagnan when he was on duty. The company of M. de Chevalier d'Essessar thus received four instead of one when it admitted D'Artagnan. 
End of chapter.